Yes, I have a question. Thank you. Ms. Monreal, what is your question? Um, it was on the test. Okay. One that I didn't understand. Sure. Um, one second. Um, no, you're, you're fine. I think there were a lot of the, I, you know, I went over the test with somebody yesterday and there was a lot of questions that I was questioning. They were challenging. Okay. I didn't understand. The question was, which shoulder movement would lengthen the fibers of the subscapularis? And the answer was abduction, but I'm having a hard time understanding why sure. that would sure. lengthen it. Sure, and the answer was abduction, right? No, no, no. The answer. Oh, right, right, right. I get what you're saying. Um, yeah. So the answer was lateral rotation. Oh. By the way, I think you could have argued that abduction might lengthen it, but let's let's take a look here. Hold on, grab some tape. Sorry, I was not prepared. All right, I'm prepared now. Okay. Okay. So. This, i got to make sure i got the right thing with the right thing. I think I've got the wrong scapulator. Hold on. I do. Okay. I've got to match the, the scapula with the humerus. This is a left scapula, and it does matter. So if this was my scapula, if this was my scapula, it would be back here like this. And this would actually be the underneath part, the subscapularis. This would be like you're looking through my chest, and you're able to see my scapula here. This is the subscapularis, and that's what the question's about, right? Yes. Okay. So the subscapularis, really quickly, let me just show you. I'm only using one piece of tape, by the way. I hope you all recognize a lot of these muscles are a lot bigger, but this gives you the idea of the direction that things are running and what's going on. All right, let's do this. The subscapularis runs like that. So if it contracts... It creates a medial rotation. So contracting is always shortening, getting closer together, whatever. It creates a medial rotation. This question was like, what would lengthen it? Yes. The opposite of the action will always lengthen it. The opposite of a muscular action will always stretch it. Watch if I start turning laterally. What will happen? I pull it away from there. Does that help visually? Did that not help? It's okay if it didn't help. It helped, but do you want to know why it helped? What, what, yeah, because why? I just realized I was thinking of uh, infraspinatus. Ah, <laughs> yes. Okay. But so, yeah, it makes sense now. I, I don't know why I was thinking of Okay. All right. Yeah. But, but here's the I beauty. I appreciate your demonstration. Well, hold on. I appreciate you, actually, because I was just telling this to another student the other day and uh, yesterday. And I really meant it, and I mean it with you too for the exact same reason. These are the type of mistakes that reassure me. I could care less if you get muscles mixed up, right? You understand the concept of what we're talking about. You literally mistook this muscle for this muscle. Yeah. Literally this. And so you understand the concept that, yep, it rolls this way, and understand the concept that, yes, it rolls that way. You get it. You just mixed up your muscles. I told yeah, you a whole bunch of muscles, and they're named like, blah, 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 yeah. and you're like, I get those mixed up, because they all sound like Harry Potter names. Yes. So anyway, this is great. It's a great mistake. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad I could help, even though you just realized you mixed up your muscles. Awesome. Miss Cooper, yes. Okay, so I think something just clicked for me, too. So, so you said that... So, the opposite of its action will lengthen it? The opposite of its action will lengthen it. Yeah. I keep saying these phrases. I don't, I don't mean this way it sounds. I don't mean I keep saying them. You guys don't get it. Well, I keep saying exciting. them because they're, they're very hard to kind of get. <laughs> I don't know why, but they were hard for me to get too. And I was a good student, but they're just hard. No, but so, I'm, I'm getting it. Yeah. So like with infraspinatus, its action... If it were laterally rotating, the opposite would be medially. Yes. So it would lengthen yes. It. And every single time this works. So let's pretend that my arm is a muscle, okay? It is shortening now and pulling this, this bone to it. If you pull the bone away from it, it lengthens. 
the opposite action lengthens it. Every time it contracts, it shortens, it gets shorter, blah, blah, blah. When you pull it away and do the opposite action, whatever that opposite action is, it lengthens. Yay, I get it. Yay, Miss Cooper, good. Let me ask you some questions really quick then. Let's do it. Yay. What's the opposite of flexion? Um, the opposite of flexion would be extension. Yes. What's the option of adduction? Um, you said ad. Ad, A-D. Abduction? Yes. What's the opposite of extension? Um, flexion. Yes. What's the opposite of abduction? Adduction. What's the opposite of elevation? Um, depression. Yes. What's the opposite of medial rotation? Lateral rotation? Yes. <laughs> What's the opposite of protraction? Um, the opposite of protraction? Oh, no. What is this one? You can take it back. Oh. You can retract the statement if you want. No, retraction. Yes! How'd you get that? Yeah. What's the opposite of retraction? You helped. <laughs> <laughs> I try to help every single question. I try to give you guys some kind of clue. Uh, what's the opposite of retraction? Um, protraction. Thank you. Cool. You now know how to stretch every muscle in the human body, essentially. Yeah. Um, so that's cool. That's cool, cool, cool. I have a question, too. Yes, Miss Yadas. What is your question? Okay, These are so great it questions. says to access the supraspinatus tendon, you must sink your fingers deep into which muscle? I answered the trapezius, but the answer was the deltoid, and I guess I'm just confused there. <laughs> I'm sure somebody else out in the audience is smiling, so to speak, because they asked me the same question yesterday, and we went over it in gory detail. Um, let me show you why. By the way, you're close, for what it's worth. So, let's look at this. Let me make sure I can get this really close here. Okay. All right. We see the skeleton. I'm gonna I'm gonna give this skeleton a supraspinatus muscle. It's up here in the supraspinous fossa, and it goes over here to the greater tubercle. Can you kind of see it? You probably can't see it in the fossa because it's down in here, but you can see this thing going over here. Yeah, I can see it. All right, this is called the belly of the muscle. This is where it inserts. Uh, the, sorry, forget what I just said. This is the belly of the muscle. This is its origin. It inserts over here. The trapezius comes down, and its insertion is what? Lateral one-third of the clavicle, chromium process, and spina scapula. It's covering this part. Tendons are what attach it to the bone. The tendon down here attaches it to the humerus. What's over this? What's this muscle? The deltoid. The deltoid. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so now that's why, I get it. Thank yeah. You. But your answer was a good one in the sense that I was like, at least she knows roughly where this thing is. You knew it was up here. You're just very hard to visualize where all this stuff is. Yeah. Good. That's a great question. Who can top that? Give me a better question. No, those are all great. Anything else? No? Good? Okay. Let's, um, let's, let's review a little bit before we go on and learn about new muscles today. Um, let's review actions first. By actions, I'm going to, I wonder if the weather has an effect on my Wi-Fi. I think maybe it does. I'm sorry, Miss Hunter. <laughs> but I'm glad to see you, even if you're frozen. Um, let's do actions. And uh, I just want to ask you to perform an action for me. Okay? So actions are things like flexion, extension, elevation, depression, protraction, retraction, all that kind of stuff. Yeah? Okay. Um, Miss Petrie, can you show me an elevation of your scapula? Can you show me a depression of your scapula? Thank you, Miss Petrie. Miss Stanley, can you show me a medial rotation of your glenohumeral humeral joint? It's kind of medial rotation of your arm, if that helps. Medial rotation. Yep. Yeah, you're just turning your arm in. Your arm is just turning in. Just turning in. Cool. Can you show me a lateral rotation of your glenohumeral joint? Yes. And it's not even going back. It's as though if my arm is here, that's lateral rotation, that's medial rotation. It's just what happens up here. Nice. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Miss Nguyen, 
Hi! Um, Miss New Yen, I like how you laugh every time I call on you. It's such a good attitude. It's better than crying. Um, Miss New Yen, can you yeah. show me a flexion of your glenohumeral joint? It's your shoulder. Can you show me a flexion? Kind of a flexion of your arm. Flexion in the same zap? Yes, but in front of you. I want to see it in front of you. Here. Yes. Okay. In front of you is flexion. Good. Can you show me an extension of your arm? Your glenohumeral. Uh, extension? Yeah. Extension here. Yep. It's just going back. By the way, everybody, this is flexion. That's extension. The minute I start going back, it becomes extension. I don't have to be back here for it to be an extension. Anytime I'm moving forward, flexing, 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 extension, 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 flex, extend, 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 flex. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Miss Harper, Miss Harper, can you show me a protraction of your scapula, your scapula thoracic joint, your scapula protraction? Very good, actually. Everybody, she kind of did this. She kind of tried to bring her scapula forward. Yeah, good. Can you show me a retraction of your scapula? That's kind of good posture, right? Retraction your scapula. Yeah, awesome. Okay, thank you. Miss Hansen, <laughs> Miss Hansen, can you show me an abduction of your scapula? An abduction uh, of your scapula. Of the scapula? Yep. Is it up this way? It's not up anyway. To go away. I didn't say elevation. I said abduction. Uh, it's this way. Yes. So, it's a protraction. Yes. Does everybody understand why that's true? Because we know why a protraction is an abduction of your scapula. If you don't speak now or forever hold your peace. Wait. Good. Who said wait? Good. Um, yes, Miss Monreal. So, is it because it's going away from the midline? Wow, you should teach the class. Yes, that's exactly right. So it's because, think about it, when this guy, we're looking at his back, when he protracts, his scapula goes forward, right? But his scapula is going away from the midline, the spine. So a protraction is an abduction, a retraction is an adduction of the scapula. And I'm telling you both ways because people use both language, right? So does that, that sounds, I think that made sense to you because you just said it, correct? We're good. Okay. All right. Everybody else get that? Mr. Kandaris. Mr. Kandaris, can you show me, I'll, I'll have to see more in your eyebrows, but can you show me <laughs> a uh, retraction of your scapula? It's half naked here. Good. We'll be able to see. Good. So what do you, I, I can't tell what you're doing. You can, I was like. Is that a reach or what? A retraction of your scapula? Like pulling it back, right? Yeah. Posture. yeah. 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 Good. Why don't you tell me what I'm doing right now? Protracting. Protracting. What's another word for it? Uh, uh, abduction. Excellent, sir. Thank you. It is abduction of my scapula as well. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, Miss Cooper. Miss Cooper, put your arms out to your side. Good. Show me a horizontal adduction, a deduction. Horizontal. A that would be. Wait, what? Like, wait, wait, hold on. Horizontal so, adduction. I like, want you to add your arms back to the midline. I actually like what you just did. You just showed me an adduction, so thank you. That's at least that's an adduction. But keep horizontal and show me an adduction. What like? This is at at regular adduction. You're absolutely right. Okay. Horizontal okay. adduction. Oh. No, sorry. that's twisting. I this is a neat. This is a neat move. Horizontal adduction is your arms are coming back to the midline, not your body. 
You are doing a twist right now. Stop twisting. <laughs> Just move your arms back in. Thank you. <laughs> it was on a land action. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Oh my gosh. Miss Balotic. <laughs> Miss Balotic, uh, sorry, I pulled this one out of left field. So um, you can't see what. Oh, let me grab this little guy. This will help. I just want to make sure you guys don't forget other terms, too. This guy is going to stand up on his tippy toes. What did he just do? He planted his feet really firm on the ground to do this. He planted him so he planted his feet so hardy. He, he kind of flexed himself up here. Oh, there's a name for it. Yeah, when you plant your feet really hard on the ground so hard that you kind of flex yourself up to the top here, there's a name for it. What? Flexion? Something flexion. Something flexion when you plant your feet really hard on the floor. Isn't it like with the gas pedal? Yeah, yes. Yeah, this is the way you drive. Um, so, if I plant... Oh, plantar... Plantar flexion! Yeah! Cool. All right, thank you. Um, Miss, Miss Montreal, if I lift my feet back up, like way up like this, like I'm taking my foot off the gas, or I'm stopping a door... Dorsey flexion. Dorsey flexion. Yeah. Miss Torres. Miss Torres, if I am pointing my feet in at each other, they're literally going in at each other, so I'm kind of standing on the outside edges of my, my feet. I can actually probably show you guys. Let's see if I can pull this off. Let's see. So if my feet are in like that, Miss Torres, what's that called if they're in? This is a version where my feet are in. This is uh, a inversion. Inversion. Yeah. What happens if they're out like that? Eversion. Eversion. Awesome. These are hard because we didn't do these for a long time. Yeah. Good stuff, everybody. Very, very excited. Um, Miss Felix Osuna. Miss Felix Tasuna, can you see me? Yes, I can see you. Okay. I'm going to turn my hand over because I have to hold a bowl of soup. What am I doing? Um, is that detection? I'm going to turn my hand over so I can hold a bowl of soup. Oh, um, is it... It is supination. If I turn my hand this way, I'm prone to dump it out. Formation? Yes! Awesome. Fantastic. Yes. Cool. Miss Hunter, I, was, I, I don't want you to feel left out. I wasn't calling on you because I thought you were having internet problems. So I, hopefully you can hear me at least. Yes, probably, maybe. Are you there? Okay. You'll be back. All right. Um, cool. So that's actions, right? We're doing pretty good with those. Yeah. Right? Uh, Miss Nguyen. My <laughs> muscles. Muscles. Can only yeah. only do one thing. Uh, retraction. Yes. They can only contract. They can only yeah. pull together. Retraction is actually a pretty good word, except it's another movement. But yeah, contract, pull together, shorten. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Miss Stanley. <laughs> um, in order to lengthen any muscle, in order to lengthen any muscle, you do the opposite of its what? I've never asked this question before. I've talked about it, but I've never asked it before, so it'd be hard. In order to lengthen any muscle, you do the opposite of its what? I feel like a game show. Well, you do like the opposite of what you do to contract it. Yes! 
And what a muscle does when it contracts, we call it, starts with letter A. It's action. Action. Yeah. No, I was trying to think of like extension and flexion. Like, yeah. I don't know. Well, extension and flexion are actions. So we're doing good. You're doing good. And you knew it was the opposite of its contraction, which is its action. There's a lot of, a lot of rhyming here. I feel like a Dr. Seuss thing. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let's talk about the muscles we've already learned so far or are still learning. I realize they're not kind of cemented down in your brain, right? Okay. So far, we have learned eight muscles. You may want to listen up because I'm going to ask you to name one of them. But I'm going to name them first so you know they're coming. Yeah? We've learned this big diamond muscle called the trapezius. It hooks into... Its insertion is the origin of the deltoid. So we've learned the trapezius and the deltoid. We've learned this giant muscle called the latissimus dorsi, the backside muscle, the latissimus dorsi. It's got a little helper called the teres major. There happens to be a teres minor, but we know the major goes with the latissimus dorsi because major sounds big and latissimus dorsi is big. It's the biggest muscle in the upper body. So we've got the trapezius, deltoids, Latissimus dorsi, teres major. Then we learned four rotator cuff muscles. We learned the supraspinatus, which doesn't rotate anything. We learned the subscapularis, and then we learned two that go together all the time, infraspinatus and teres minor. Always go together because they almost look alike, and they do the same darn thing, and they cover the whole backside here. Yes. Cool? Good. Okay. Miss Hunter, can you hear me? Maybe not, poor thing. I'm sorry, Miss Hunter. I can see you though. Yes. Okay, Miss Hunter, can you name the four rotator yes, cuff? Yes, I can hear you. Cool. Can you name the four rotator cuff muscles? Yes, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, subscapularis. Yeah. Heck yeah, you can, Miss Hunter. Since we <laughs> since we have a brief window of connection, you and I, um, can you tell me the other four muscles <laughs> we've learned about? Just their names. Uh, the other four muscles that go with what? I'm sorry, that was confusing. We asked. We learned four other muscles. We learned like this thing that hangs off the back of my head and the muscles here on my shoulder and this big one on my back. We learned four other muscles before we learned about the rotator cuff muscles. Do you remember the names of the four other muscles we learned? Oh, um, the latissimus dorsi. Yep. Anytime. The biceps. Well, hold on. The hold hold oh. on. Anytime you say latissimus dorsi, what's the next muscle you should say? Oh, is it teres major or teres minor? It's teres major. Latissimus dorsi is big. Teres major is bigger. Okay. So latissimus dorsi, teres major. Cool. And then you learn about two muscles that share an attachment. Two muscles that share an attachment of the lateral one-third of the clavicle, the acromion process, and the spinous scapula. What are those two muscles that come together here? Um... The two muscles that come together there? Yeah. The bicep and the traps, trapezius. Trapezius and what? What's the muscle here on the side here that makes up my shoulders? Not my guns, my shoulders. Deltoid. Deltoid! We actually haven't learned about the, the biceps deltoid. yet. Cool. <laughs> That's perfect. That was fantastic. Thank you, Miss Hunter. Yeah. Miss Montreal. What are the four rotator cuff muscles? Uh, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, um, subscapularis, and teres minor, which was supposed to be with infraspinatus. Oh my God, you're getting good because I was literally going to make you repeat it to go back and do that. Thank you. That's exactly right. By the way, in the real world, it's okay to say them in whatever order you want, but I want us to pairing stuff together for reasons, right? Cool. Thank you. Miss Belotic. Miss Belotic, what are the four rotator cuff muscles? 
the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres minor, and the subscapularis. Thank you, ma'am. Miss Cooper! Miss Cooper, you're frozen, so I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah? We're coming back to you, Miss Cooper. Mr. Turn to me, because you were, you were all, you're, you're all frozen. We were frozen, you were frozen. No, I'm kidding. Miss Cooper. Well, it, it's I'm kidding. very choppy right now. All right, Miss Cooper, then a quick one. What are the four rotator cuff muscles? Four rotator cuff um, muscles. Infraspinatus slash teres minor. Yep. Um, the... Supraspinatus, the subscapularis. Stop, that's four. Stop, that's four. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what else you're going to say, but stop. You just got it right. All right, moving right along. I didn't along. know what else I was going to say either. Good. That's why I stopped you before you got in trouble. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Kandaris, of the four rotator cuff muscles, sir, which one is responsible for an abduction of the humerus? Which one helps me to do this? Can you hear me, sir? Oh, sorry, the supraspinatus. Excellent. How did you know it was the supraspinatus? You're right, by the way. Because uh, I looked at my butt. <laughs> okay. Audience. That's to no, that's totally fine. Um, actually, a lot of times I want you guys looking here, but cool. Here's another way to think about it, everybody, when I ask if it's the supraspinatus. This abduction, where would you have to be on my body to lift my arm up? to pull it up. You wouldn't be underneath it, right? You can't pull an arm up. You have to be on top to pull it up, right? Does that make sense? So you gotta look for muscles on top. Yeah? Does that make sense? Miss Felix Sasuna, does that make sense? Yes. Good, Miss Felix Sasuna. So then you could actually name two muscles that abduct my arm, since you know they have to be on top. What are they? Give me two muscles that abduct my arm that we've learned so far. Abduct my. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, uh, the first one would be supraspinatus, and then the other one from the muscle we learned last week. What would be on top of the glenohumeral joint? The deltoid. Yes. The middle fibers of the deltoid, probably all of them, but the middle fibers of the deltoid are on top, right? Now, if I would have said elevate, that would be a different muscle. But moving this joint, it's the deltoid. Mm -hmm. Excellent job. Excellent thinking. You don't have to memorize the actions. You could start to figure them out. Yeah? Ms. Yeah. Torres. Ms. Torres, can you or Allison tell me which rotator cuff muscles can cause a lateral rotation of the glenohumeral joint, or actually they could also cause a horizontal uh, horizontal abduction too. But anyway. Uh, the infraspinatus and the teres minor? Yes. Thank you for putting them together. Infraspinatus and teres minor. Can you tell me another muscle that we learned last week they could also cause a lateral rotation of the shoulder. Um, if, Miss Torres, if I want my um, shoulders to roll back, something's yeah. got to be behind them. Behind them. So think about stuff behind there that's grabbing onto my humerus, besides the infraspinatus. Yeah, middle fibers of the Oh, yeah, that's really good. You're in the right area. But the trapezius doesn't grab my arm. It grabs my scapula. So the middle fibers of my trapezius retract my scapula. I want something that actually pulls back my arm. So it can't insert into my scapula. It needs to insert into my humerus. Oh, the, the, um, the, 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 the latissimus dorsi? The latissimus dorsi does insert into my arm, but inserts in the front, so it actually causes a medial rotation because it grabs from underneath and pulls my arm in. 
something that kind of could oh. grab on. Maybe something that inserts into the deltoid tuberosity. That's what I would pick. Something that inserts into that. Pick one of the muscles that inserts into oh. the deltoid tuberosity. The posterior deltoid fibers. Yeah! Cool. Because they're behind, so they can pull back and they can kind of roll back. And a lateral rotation is kind of a roll back. What? What'd you say? I don't know what I was thinking. I don't know why I was overthinking it. That's okay. That's okay. We're, we're, we're doing something really hard, by the way, everybody. We are talking about three-dimensional bodies in a two-dimensional format on a screen, right? While we look at a two-dimensional book, using all sorts of weird language and thinking about things in lots of different ways. You guys are doing absolutely fantastic, and I sincerely mean that. I'm delighted. This is very tricky. I get confused. You'll listen to me. You'll hear me mess up and be like, hey, no, don't do that. So, and I've been doing this 25 years. You've been doing this about 25 minutes. Okay. So, um, Miss, Miss, Miss Giannis, tell me out of the eight muscles that we've learned, one, or there might be more, I don't know, don't want to lead the witness, of the muscles that can do a medial rotation of the glenohumeral humeral joint. That means it crosses over the glenohumeral humeral joint, it's, it's turning my arm. Not protracting or retracting, a medial rotation of my glenohumeral humeral joint. And think about where you'd have to be to make that happen. So she's really smart on this one, guys. She figures it's in front, this thing goes like this, and it will turn my arm in. That's true. So guessing a muscle in front is a great guess. Awesome. Anterior deltoid is one. You are absolutely right. Are there any more or is that it? Uh, the subscapularis. Subscapularis actually reaches underneath and grabs in front, and so it can pull it to the back. Yes. So subscapularis. Is that it? And then the latissimus dorsi and the, or yeah, just the, the latissimus dorsi and the teres major. Yeah! All four muscles! Good job! That's awesome! Yes, there are four muscles that can actually create a, a medial rotation of the glenal uh, humeral joint. That's fantastic. Way to think. I love that. So she caught the concept of muscles in front turning it, and also ones reaching underneath from in back to pull it, to pull it back. Really well done. Very, very cool. Um, Ms. Hansen. Which muscle am I using to elevate my scapula? My what? Your trapezius. Yes, trapezius. Which fibers? The cool. Thank you, ma'am. Miss Harper. Which muscles am I using to depress my scapula? Yes, which fibers? Yes, I love how you went like this. I was like, yeah, the down ones, those, whatever. That probably would have worked too. Lower, down, whatever. Those other fibers. Cool, thank you. Miss Nguyen. Now, Miss Nguyen, if you were listening, I know you were. Miss um, Hansen just got the question of, which muscle is, is doing this? And she said the upper fibers of the trapezius. And then Miss Harper, I asked, which muscle is doing this? And she said the lower fibers of the trapezius. It's almost like there's a pattern going here with trapezius. Which, which muscle is responsible for retracting or adducting my scapula, pulling it straight back, pulling my scapula straight back? Which muscle? No. No. So it's got to be a muscle, my dear, it's got to be a muscle that grabs on my scapula and pulls it towards my spine here. Something in here. When you think of a muscle we know so far that's in here. It's in here too. It's down here too. But it's it's a big diamond shaped muscle and it's right in here. It can pull across. Uh, chest, 
Trap? Here, say trap. Just say trap. You're absolutely right, by the way. But say trap. Yeah, trap Just, just say trap. Don't say anything else. Just say trap. Trap. Easy. E. Z. Easy. Trap easy. Trap easy. Us. Us. Trap easy us. Trap easy us. Bam! Yeah. Yeah, you said that better than half the class. Yeah, they don't know what they're doing. You're nailing it. All right. Yeah, Thank you, ma'am. Which fibers of the trapezius would pull my shoulders back? Uh, is it, would it be the upper ones? Would it be the lower ones? Would it be the ones in the middle? But you were looking at your book. <laughs> Which no, ones? I write, I write about what you talk about in the chat easily, and I need to write about that. Oh, it's good. Easy. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for taking notes. But yeah. which fibers are pulling the shoulders back? Is it the ones up here? Is it the ones down here? It's the ones in the middle that pulled it together. Is it upper, middle, or lower fibers that retract my scapula? Is it, is it, Miss Nguyen, just yeah. look at me for a second. My upper fibers, if they contract, they do this, right? Yeah. Okay. My lower fibers, if they contract, they pull my shoulder back down. Yeah. What do you think my middle fibers do? What do you think? Uh, I think it's called a uh, uh, D-check, D-check. Boom. Yeah. And what muscle were we just talking about? What's it called again? The tra trap? Uh, trap. 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 Idiot. <laughs> All right. You just, you just, you're done for the day. That was awesome. That's it. Cool. Okay. You're not done for the day. I was teasing, but that's awesome. Fantastic. Okay. I think we've talked about trapezius and deltoids, and I see a lot of smiling faces. That makes me very happy. Um, We've talked about the rotator cuff muscles, all that kind of stuff. Let's learn some new muscles. Yay! <laughs> Had a lot of coffee. Yes, Miss Petrie. I saw that look. All right. Okay. Let me present my slideshow. It's kind of exciting. Isn't the human body amazing? All right. Let's see here. Hold on. I need to do a couple things. Present a window. Do, 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 share. Okay. All right, everybody. Okay. So, um, we've learned something about opposites lately, right? We've learned, Miss Cooper was uh, explaining us, she was educating all of us, that the opposite of a flexion was an extension, the opposite of an adduction was an abduction, all that kind of stuff. And we kind of learned that the opposite of a contraction is a stretch, right? Your muscles either shorten or lengthen. Um, and so that's really important in massage therapy because muscles kind of argue with one another sometimes, right? When this one pulls, my body wants to stay in good posture. It can't fall over, so it gets another one to pull me back. So if I'm hunched over the computer like this all day long, I've got other muscles trying to pull me back here. And so I'm fighting myself quite often. And so we're going to be excellent massage therapists. We're not just going to rub the spot where it hurts. We're going to rub the other muscle that's fighting with that muscle so that we stop the problem. Right? We're going to put both kids in timeout when they're fighting instead of just one. Okay? Um, and so today we're going to learn about some muscles that can work with or fight against because they do opposite actions of muscles that you already know. Yeah, it's about to get real. Okay. Let's see. Um, let's see. So, can everybody see my slide right now of the muscles of the shoulder and arm? It says page 61 on my slide. That must be the page it's on. Hopefully you can see this. Can you guys see my slide? Or can you see page 61? The left-hand side of this body is showing you some muscles you've already learned about. 
Remember, the left-hand side is not the same as the right-hand side in these pictures because they tear off more muscles on the other side to show you more stuff. So on the left-hand side, you should be able to see half a trapezius. Can you see half a trapezius? Thank you for nodding. You've learned about the trapezius. If you follow the trapezius down or out, it runs into the deltoid. You guys have learned about the deltoid. You can see that too. Yeah? Yeah, good. By the way, I'm not trying to talk down to you ever. I'm just trying to kind of like talk us through this thought process, right? I'm a big believer in that. So can you see the latissimus dorsi kind of rising up from the hips, going through the thoracolumbar fascia or aponeuroses in this big, beautiful muscle and then disappearing under the armpit? That's latissimus dorsi. Up above it is the teres major, and up above that is the teres minor, and up above that is the infraspinatus. Can you see that? All on the left-hand side. Cool. Awesome. I'm not asking you to, like, process it or anything. I'm just kind of like, are you aware it's there? Cool. So we've kind of learned about those muscles. If you tore the trapezius and the latissimus dorsi and the deltoid off that body, you'd have the right-hand side picture. If you tore off the latissimus dorsi, the trapezius, and the deltoid, you'd have the other side. And we're going to learn about some of these muscles on the other side. Uh, in particular, can you find the rhomboids major and minor in the levator scapula in that picture? Cool. Okay. Uh, we're going to be talking about the rhomboids, the levator scapula, the serratus anterior, and pectoralis minor today. Kind of exciting. Okay, you can't see some of those from this picture. All you can see is the rhomboids and the levator scapula. Levator scapula is up by the neck, and rhomboids major and minor are actually between the spine of your body and, and the shoulder blades. So a lot of people, when they're tight in their back, by the way, a lot of people, when they're tight in their back, are actually tight in the rhomboids. It's not their trapezius. It's, it's the rhomboids underneath. Okay? All right. And notice the rhomboids run at a little bit of an angle. Yeah? They're a little bit like a Christmas tree. Do we see that? Okay. All right. We're just kind of familiarizing ourselves with the landscape before we take a walk down this back here. I have a question. Perfect. What's your question? That you don't have to answer right now because I'm sure you'll probably say we'll get to that, but I'll forget to ask later. Yeah, I'll forget to tell you later, so ask so, me now. Why would somebody be tight in the rhomboids but not necessarily the traps? Oh, thank you. By the way, um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I'm, and I wasn't quite trying to mean him to imply that. I'm sorry, I said it wrong. I would suspect they'd probably be tight in both, to be honest okay. with you. Um, yes, they could be tight in one over the other because of the way their nerves fire or what got pinched. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons. What I meant to imply, I'm so sorry. Thank you for asking this question. What I meant to imply was a lot of massage therapists think it's just on the surface. It's just these traps. There is another muscle under there that does, the rhomboids do a very similar thing to your middle traps. And so they're often a culprit too. That's what I should have just said. They're often another factor in tight shoulders. That's what I should have said. So I'm really glad you asked the question because I didn't really state it right. Um, of course, any muscle on your body can be tight by itself, but you're right. They probably would be tight together. Yeah. Um, okay. Yes, do you have a question, Mr. Yen? Uh, I, I only ask questions with fun. Okay. But I want to ask you the, uh, something in the, uh, you eat meat, right? No, I don't eat meat. Oh. Sorry. No, I put meat in the meat in the muscle, right? Do, what, what about the muscle? I say in the, some, you, I think, I think in the, some in the meat you eat, and I think in the muscle. The muscle is the meat you eat, is that what you're asking? Uh, no, I say, I mean in the, so I, I write for you and you can see. Okay, thank you. I'm so sorry. I'm just not getting it. By the way, though, everybody, this I'm going to share something with you because I shared it with my girlfriend like a week ago. And she's like, you mean they're the same thing? And I'm like, they're the exact same thing. 
Meat we eat can is muscle. The meat yeah. we eat is muscle. Right? Yes. So I told this to, I told this to my girlfriend and she's like she's like, Well, it's like what's muscle? I'm like, it's the meat people eat. And she's like, Well, what do you mean? I'm like, they're the exact same thing. When you eat a chicken breast, yeah. you are eating the pectoralis major of a chicken. Yeah, and the muscle, Period. Right? When you are eating a rump roast, you are eating the gluteus maximus of a cow. Period. You are eating exactly that. Like, it's real muscle. It's real muscle fiber. If I cut into my butt and we cooked it up, you wouldn't probably be able to tell the difference between it and a cow's butt. I mean, it might be smaller. Maybe not, actually. I don't know. But the point is, the point is, muscle is muscle. Yes. Yeah. Your muscle in your body is exactly the muscle that you guys eat when you kill those sweet, innocent animals and cook them up and devour them. No, I'm teasing. It's fine, yeah. whatever you do. But but the point is, yes, muscle is muscle. So I'm really glad you asked that because I told my girlfriend that too. And she's like, I, I, I never, she's like, I didn't really quite fully put that together. You know? And I was like, when you guys get gristle in your mouth, that's fascia that you can't chew through. And if you've ever seen like, like a white piece at the end of a chicken breast that looks like a tiny little white rubber band or whatever, that's a tendon. That's tendon. That's muscular tendon. You know? See, yes, sir. It's funny that you just said all that because as you were like talking about that, I just took apart a whole chicken. Like I got one of those, uh, what do you call it? Uh, like the ones that are already cooked. And so like sometimes it's cheaper. I'll just take apart the meat. And I was literally thinking all of this as I was taking it apart. And I was like pulling the meat off like the, you know, the breastbone. And like I was, it was interesting to actually like look at it and like, oh, this is what I'm doing. Yeah. And like I felt that tendon, I felt that like bone, I felt that muscle. Yeah, and that's actually a really cool thing about um, next time you guys do eat meat, this is, I'm sorry, by the way, and Ms. Hunter, you're right, I'm trying to interject my own agenda, and it's not, I should not be doing that. You, there's nothing wrong with you guys eating meat, but next time you do, look at it, because it'll tell you a lot about anatomy. So when he, when Mr. Kandaris held up that thing, did you notice the chicken was shredded? It shreds for a reason. The little shredding is because there's fascia around little bundles of muscle fiber. Muscle fiber is like smaller than hair, and there's a whole bunch of them, and they're wrapped in fascia. The individual fibers are wrapped, but the bigger fibers are wrapped in fascia. So when you shred it apart, it comes apart like wires. It comes apart in shreds. It's why it shreds, because there's still fascia in it, and the fascia is holding together little microscopic bundles. So each of those little shreds is like, I don't know, 100 little muscle fibers wrapped in fascia. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Miss Hunter. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't want to insult anybody, that's all. I'm always just kind of kidding with you guys. You're welcome to eat meat. Um, I did it for years, by the way. I have no place to say. I was the biggest meat eater ever. Um, anyway, so that's kind of cool, though, when he shred that chicken breast apart because you can see it shreds because fascia is wrapped around all the muscle fibers. And he got to see the tendon and stuff like that. Yeah. Cool? Yay. Muscle is meat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. Um, okay. Uh, can you see a side view of the levator scapula here? Side view, it's in the neck. I just want you to kind of see that it, it's kind of behind the trapezius. It kind of disappears underneath the trapezius. Because these muscles are underneath the trapezius. They're underneath the lats. They're underneath the deltoids, right? We're going down deeper. The trapezius, deltoid, latissimus dorsi are superficial muscles, right? Just like when you have a superficial co uh, conversation and we just talk about the weather and we don't get deep, that's superficial. It's on the surface. Latissimus dorsi is on the surface. If I go poke a back in this area, the first thing I'm going to poke is skin, but the second thing I would poke into is latissimus dorsi. If I poke up here, the first thing I'm going to poke into is the trapezius. So we're ripping those off. These muscles are underneath those. They lie deep. So if there's a question, I don't know if there is one, by the way. I'm not trying to set you up, but I'm just trying to make you understand. The rhomboids are deep to the trapezius. The trapezius is superficial to the rhomboids. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes? Okay. 
Boom. Du, du, du. Okay. Um, I want you to take really close look at this slide on page 62. I want you to find the serratus anterior. It's on the left-hand side. I want you to find the serratus anterior. They're very hard to see. They look like a couple little fingers sticking out. They are coming out from underneath the lats because they run deep to the lats. They're underneath the lats, the latissimus dorsi, right? When a bodybuilder like spreads their arms like this and they've got this big V, that's their latissimus dorsi. But when they kind of lift their arm up like this and you see little finger projections up here, that's their serratus anterior. If you see it down here, by the way, it's their abdominals. Um, they're, they're external obliques. But up here, kind of coming out from their armpit, these little like finger projections, um, all ripply and stuff like that, that's their serratus anterior. It's coming from their backside, but it's coming around front here. When you want to find the serratus anterior, you basically find the ribs and start rubbing the ribs. We'll experiment with that later, but I just want to kind of give you a feeling they're kind of hidden, right? So it's kind of the lats, the serratus anterior, and then the ribs. Serratus anterior is actually on top of the ribs. In fact, they feel like meaty ribs when you're on them. They just feel like meatier ribs. Cool. Okay. And by the way, one other muscle I'd like you to find here um, is the pectoralis minor. Pectoralis minor is on the right-hand side. Then, do me a favor. Take your fingers like these. Thank you, Miss Nguyen. Take your fingers like these. Do this. Copy me. Hey. Copy me, though. Do what I'm doing. Put your fingers up. Show me your hand. Thank you. Yeah. Take your fingers like this and do this. Put it on your chest like this, everybody. Pointing down like that. Everybody see that? Miss Cooper, put it down like that. I think you just froze. You probably are. Say pectoralis minor. Friend, friend. Peck. Peck. Tor. Tor. Alice. Alice. Cool. Peck for Alice. Pectoralis minor. Everybody. This is almost exactly the size and the shape of the pectoralis minor. That's why I'm having you do it. And you're going to see in a second it's going to really help you. We'll, we'll come back to this. Thank you for playing along. We'll come back to this. All right. Let us talk about the rhomboids. Do we need a quick five-minute break? I just saw a yawn, which is totally fine. Let's have a five-minute break before we kind of get into these. We're kind of we're warming up. You guys are doing great. Go take a five-minute break. Run around the block. Stretch out. To stretch out, you do the opposite of any muscular action. Stretch out, get some coffee, eat some breakfast, eat some chicken, um, and we'll see you in a minute. Five minutes.
Are you making rhomboids? Yes, sir, I am. I'm making rhomboids. Well said. So I just because it's like a rhomboid, it's actually like really easy to like, you know, the connections, I guess. Yeah. Like, I literally, were, I mean, I kind of know what they were, but not really. But, uh, at like, I guess I learned them in like two seconds yesterday just because of their shape. Yeah, that's exactly right. If you can visualize stuff, it really helps. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody. Come on back. Come on back so we can learn about the back. Miss New Yen, are you there? Hi, Miss Stanley. Miss Pilotic, are you there? Hi, Miss Hunter. Cool, thank you. Good, I see that. Miss Felix Osuna. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Miss mm -hmm. Nguyen. Nice living room. Or bed, no, bedroom maybe? Bedroom, sorry. Come to class. Okay. Page 82, yes. All right. Um... Let's talk about the rhomboids, major and minor, okay? Um, the rhomboids, major and minor, are basically found on your back between your, your shoulder blades. Basically found on your back between your shoulder blades. Miss Harper, the rhomboids, major and minor, are deep to what muscle? Um, Meaning they're underneath what, what muscle? Yeah, you're 100% correct. Yeah. Uh, Miss Hanson, the rhomboids are deep to the trapezius. Which part of the trapezius basically are they deep to? The mid? Yeah, yeah. I realize it's not exact, but yeah, they're deep to the middle trapezius. And by the way, not completely, but they kind of do some of the stuff the middle trapezius does. No surprise there. Cool. All right. So, remember if I talk in a certain way, it's usually to make a point to help you remember stuff. So, you've got rhomboids major and minor. 
And by the way, as far as I know, they always work together. I don't really understand why they make a distinction between them. Um, if we cut into a human body right now, it would actually be very hard to tell the difference between the two. They kind of run into each other. I'm using two different colors of tape, but if I'd use the same color of tape here, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between them, right? Right. Okay. So, the rhomboid major is underneath the rhomboid minor. I, I usually tell, this doesn't always work, but I usually tell myself the minor rides on the shoulders of the major. When my little girl was little, she'd ride on my shoulders all the time. The minor rides on the shoulders of the major. So the minor's above the major. But anyway, the major is about four fingers wide. The minor is about two fingers wide. Yep. Miss Giannis, how wide is the major? About four fingers. Thank you. Miss Torres, how wide is the, ma the minor? Sorry, about two. It takes, it, it takes a little while. You're good. You're good. I got to have a couple of grapes. It's all good. Thank you. Two. Okay. <laughs> the major. The major has an origin. All this stuff has an origin along your, your spinous processes, right? Remember that your spinous processes are these things that stick out the back of your spine. You can feel them on people. You try not to massage them when you're massaging because they hurt. They're the part right in the middle of somebody's back that sticks straight out their back, right? Um, that's what this, that's these bumps that come down the back here, and that's where this, this muscle's origin is, right? Because this is the part that doesn't move as much. The scapula moves. That's the insertion. But anyway... Very interestingly, the major that is about four fingers wide attaches to four spinous processes. T2, T3, T4, T5. Miss Felix Osuna, how many spinous processes are the origin of the rhomboids major? What was the question? The how major? many? Yeah, the rhomboids major. How many spinous processes does it attach to, or its origin? Um, four. Yeah. T two, T three, T four, T five. Cool. All right. Yes. Thank you. Um, the rhomboid minor which rides on the shoulders of the major, like my daughter used to ride on my shoulders, is two fingers wide, and it attaches to two spinous processes. Right? It's got two spinous processes for its origin. Mr. Kandaris, how many spinous processes form the origin of the rhomboids minor? Yes, yeah, sir. That's right. C7 and T1. Now, by the way, people get confused on this. Don't forget. Um, Miss Cooper, how many cervical, <laughs> how many cervical vertebrae do we have? These are my cervical vertebrae. How many cervical vertebrae do I have? Uh, before you held up your fingers, I promise I was going to say eight. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, I'm glad I held up my fingers. So what's the answer? Um, wait, what? It's not eight? No. It's seven? Yes, this is seven. Seven? Seven. <laughs> so. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Seven's the correct answer. Okay. So what would the first cervical be called? See what? See what number? Sorry, you're breaking up. What's your first cervical vertebrae called? What number? C what? I'm going to come back to you. Oh, know. that's yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't know what she's saying. I'm going to just get C7. <laughs> no, I'm going to come back to you because you're right. I'm breaking up. It's not you. It's me. 
Um, Miss Monreal. Miss Monreal, what is the first cervical vertebrae called? C1. Good. What's the second one called? C2. Third one? C3. Fourth one? C4. Fifth one? C5. Sixth one? C6. Seventh one? C7. Eighth cervical vertebrae? T1. Yes! Actually, that was an excellent answer. Thank you. And that's the point I was trying to make. Thank you. There is no eighth cervical vertebrae. So once you get to C7, you go to T1. I just want to make that very clear. I know it's just the very next vertebrae, but this is thoracic one, right? How many thoracic vertebrae do we have, Miss Monreal? Oh, shoot. No? Uh, wait, 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 wait. How many ribs do we have? Oh, 12. How many thoracic vertebrae do we have? 12. Yeah! Damn, I thought you didn't know. All right. So, T1, T2, T3. Once we get down to T12, which you guys can't even see on the screen right now, but get down to T12, we get into the next section. So, after T12, what's the name for T13? Uh, L1. Yes, thank you. Lumbar 1, lumbar 2, lumbar 3, lumbar 4, lumbar 5. What's the name for lumbar 6? Uh, wait. Uh, something, S1. Yeah, S1, your sacrum. Thank you. Beautifully done. I just want to make this point to people. Yes, you've got like 24 vertebrae here, but the way we name them is C1 through 7, and then we start over T1 through 12, and then we start over L1 through 5, and then we get to the sacrum. Okay. I want to explain that because up here, you've got a C7, T1. That's only two vertebrae, right? Cool. Okay. So, Miss Petrie, Miss Petrie, how many spinous processes form the origin of the uh, rhomboids major? Four. Yeah, the four-fingered one is, is four. How many spinous processes form the origin of the rhomboid minor that rides on the shoulders of the major? Two. Two. Fingers wide. Wow. And three vertebrae. Miss Petrie, knowing that fact, does that mean that if you knew this thing started at C7, that you could probably figure out all these origins all the way down? Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Yes, sir. Wow. Good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, ma'am. Um, so we would know that the origins for the rhomboid minor, if we know this is C7, we know the origins would be C7 and what? T1. T1. And then we know the origins for the major would be T2. Three, four, and five. Bam! Quit showing off! Yeah! Yeah! Wow! And we have a rough idea of the size of this muscle, because we know it's about the size of a, of a hand plus two fingers, four fingers plus two fingers, so six fingers. We've got an idea of like how it runs. We know it kind of goes diagonal. This is fantastic! Okay, let's talk about where it inserts over here, everybody. This is beautiful. It says it inserts into the medial border, right? So it's talking about this edge here, this edge, and that's important. Um, inserts into the medial border. The major inserts into the medial border between the spine of the scapula and the inferior angle. They're describing this area. Here's the spine of the scapula at the medial border. Here's the inferior angle. That's where it inserts. I didn't tape it very well, but that's where it inserts. Does that make sense? They're telling you, look for the medial border, start down here, and stop up here. Stop at the spine of the scapula, where the spine of the scapula meets the medial border. They're kind of describing it like street intersections in a way, you know what I mean? But do we get that, this, this medial border here, inferior angle, it runs up, 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 gets to the spine of the scapula, stops. That's where the major goes. So, that's where the major goes. Yeah? And the minor inserts essentially across, on the medial border too, but essentially across from the spine of the scapula, because it's tiny, and it essentially just comes in here across from the spine of the scapula. And if you look at the pictures, now those pictures should make more sense what they're saying. 
because they throw all these words like medial and spina scapula and inferior angle and across from. But do we understand what they're trying to do? They're trying to describe locations to you. They're saying, if you want to find where this muscle goes, find the medial border. That's important. Start at the inferior angle, and that whole thing up to the spinal scapula is going to be the major. And across from the spinal scapula up here, it's going to be the minor. That's all they're saying. Yeah? Yeah. Cool. Okay. So, Miss Felix Sasuna. Miss Felix Sasuna. I want to know the origin, the origin for the rhomboid minor, the origin right here for this two-fingered muscle that starts at C7. I want to know the origin for it. That would be the spinous process of C7 and T1. Cool. Spinous process uh, C7, T1. I want to know the origin for the rhomboid major. Those are the sinus processes of T2 to T5. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. So, Miss Hansen, this isn't in the book, so I need you to think. It's not, it's not super hard, but I need you to think. So, the rhomboids of major and minor, if we put them together, they start at what for their origin? C, uh, C7. And they run to what? T5. T5, yeah. They run over how many spinous processes? Seven. Seven. Oh, sorry. Six. Six. You guys are great at anatomy. You're not so good at math. Good. Okay. <laughs> no, it's totally cool. All right. And then they run over here and they insert into the medial border of the scapula. Beautiful. Well done. All right. Miss Giannis. Uh, you're welcome to look at your book, but I don't think you need to. Can you see how these are kind of angled this way? Yeah. Okay. What would you guess two actions would be? There's actually three in your book, but the third one's hard to guess. What would be, or one action, what would one action be if these contract of the scapula? What might happen to this beautiful scapula if these contract? A retraction. A retraction, what's the other word for that? Uh, adduction. Adduction. It would add these two. What is the um, what is the action of the middle traps? The retraction of the scapula. <laughs> yep, and adduction, yep, absolutely. So, in that sense, these guys are very similar. But now, they do run uphill. So, is there something else that we could say that they do to the scapula? Uh, they can elevate it? Yes, they can elevate it. They can elevate it. Very well said. So those are two things that are very obvious. Now, by the way, your book says a downward rotation to in their right. Watch my hands. Because these are grabbing down here, if they pull, you can also get a downward rotation of my scapula. They can also pull my scapula so that the, this side goes down because the other side goes up. Does that make sense? If something's here, this is kind of how your rhomboids are. Yes, they can pull over. Yes, they can pull up. But they also can cause this tipping action. And this is a downward rotation of the scapula. Right? Does that make sense? Maybe? Sort of? Kind of? A little bit? Cool. So, it's because the chromium process is going down. That's why it's a downward I sincerely think this is my favorite class I've ever taught, and I'm not kidding you, and I've had some really good classes. It, the quality of your questions make me a better teacher. Thank you. I should be clarifying this up, but thank you for doing my job for me. You're absolutely right. This side's going up, right? This side's coming down. And we talk about up or down when it comes to scapulas from the acromion process, which is what your question was getting at. And here's why, by the way. Here's why we talk about them. This is a circle, right? How do I describe the circle going up or down? You can't. Because when this side goes down, this side goes up. When this side goes down, this side goes up. So what you honestly have to do when, you have, when you're talking about circular motions, you pick a spot. You say, okay, when the pen goes up, we're going to call that up, even though this side's going down. When the pen goes down, we're going to call that down, even though this side's going up. 
Well, the pen is the acromion process. And like I said, luckily when your arm's going up, you're usually rotating up. And when your arm's going down, you're usually rotating down. But you're absolutely right. The rhomboids are lifting the scapula up, but that causes a downward rotation, what we've chosen to call a downward rotation. Love that question. How can you go to the bathroom now? This is the best part, Miss Cooper. Okay. Awesome. All right. So, um, how do we feel about that? Do we feel like we have a general understanding? So, Miss uh, Miss Torres, Miss Torres, the rhomboids can be helpers to, can do something similar to another muscle we've already learned about that is uh, superficial to them. Uh, there's another muscle that's on top uh, of the rhomboids. Yeah, of the what? The medial fibers of the trapezius. Yeah. And we might even, by the way, that's the answer I would have given too. And we might even argue the upper fibers because there's a little bit of this lifting up action. But the fact is they can work in partnership with the traps. And it's very hard to explain, but your brain is so intelligent that if it needed a little more rotation, it might use the rhomboids more. If it needed a little more elevation, it might use the upper traps more. Like it knows how to work out those angles. It uses the different angles to get you all the beautiful nuances you do when you're dancing in front of the mirror when nobody's looking. That's all done by your brain being smart enough to pull on the rhomboids a certain amount in the traps to get different variations of scapula movement. But yes, so, so the rhomboids, major and minor, are kind of, I'm not saying exactly, kind of, um, like the middle and maybe upper fibers of the traps. They do some similar things. It's likely that when you are retracting or adducting that you're using your rhomboids and your middle traps. It's likely that when you're elevating that you're using some rhomboids and more upper traps because upper traps are really good at that and the rhomboids are helping a little bit. Okay? Make sense a little bit? Cool. But um, there is a one difference. And let's go back to you, Ms. Giannis, since you asked such a brilliant question. What is the difference in action between the rhomboids major and minor and the upper traps? Um, it's because it does the downward rotation, right? Yes. Think about it. Can you guys see this here? If I'm a rhomboid, I cause this, right? I cause this downward rotation. But what is, what's hooked to the acromion process that's going down? What muscle that we know of is hooked to the acromion process that's going down? Big muscle hooks back in my head, goes over here. The trapezius? Yes. What happens to the upper fibers of the trapezius contract? It pulls it back up. Yes. Scapula. Yes. So these are times they work separately. When you're trying to create an upward rotation of your scapula, your brain does not use your rhomboids, right? It wants to just upwardly rotate this thing. Does that mean when it comes to rotations that the rhomboids could actually fight with the upper fibers of the trapezius or vice versa? Yes, it does. Yeah. And when might that happen? Well, if I'm hunched over at a computer like this, I'm using my upper traps, I'm kind of upwardly rotating this thing, but I'm also tightening up my rhomboids to hold my arms back. Now do I have a little bit of a tug of war there? Can we see that this might cause problems? Because not only am I holding up my head, not only am I stressed out because my boss has got to get me this report, I've got to get it done by now, but I'm pulling back my shoulders, I'm retracting, I'm using my rhomboids and my traps, and they're fighting each other. Cool. So people who are de like desk job, is it typically their upper back thing? Yeah. They have lots of rhomboid problems. They have lots of trap problems. Sometimes they have lower trap problems because the lower traps are trying to pull their shoulders back down to get them back in posture. But they've got lots of, I mean, I'm oversimplifying a little bit here, but not much. They've got lots of problems from their ribs up, right? And you really look at traps and rhomboids a lot. For sure. Because my traps are not only doing that, but think about the other thing that tra the upper traps are doing. The upper traps, by the way, yes, they can elevate my shoulders, but what's the other thing they can do to my head? Extend it. Yeah. And what am I having to do when I work at a computer? I may not be pulling my head back, but I'm keeping it from falling forward, which means I'm actively trying to extend it. 
And remember, your head weighs eight to 10 pounds. If you're balancing it right here, it's fine. When you put it over a computer, by the way, if you take, this is just physics, if you take a, a 10 pound object and you let it go out about 30 degrees here, it weighs 30 pounds. The weight to the lever here is 30 pounds, whereas here it's almost nothing because it's balanced, right? You can try that with a book. To hold a book like this, it's fine. Put it out here like this and hold it. It gets a whole lot harder the further out it is. Cool. All right. Awesome. Rhomboids, kind of cool. Yeah? You're rubbing them anytime you're rubbing the middle traps. Yes, Miss Stanley? Tap Scott? Anything? Just saw Tap Scott exclamation point. Oh, okay. Oh, to read questions. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm not good at multitasking, man. Okay. So Miss Petrie, you were kind enough, I think, to ask. You don't clearly understand the rotation thing. Is that right? Okay. I don't blame you because it doesn't make sense. Let me explain again. I know the scapula is not round. I know. But if it turns... It's very hard to describe turning motions because turning motions, if, I'm t if this is a steering wheel of a car, am I turning up or down? Both. My, right now my left hand's going up, but my right hand's going down. Right now my right hand's going up, but my left hand's going down. So on the human body, we said, well, let's just pick a spot. And when it goes up, we'll call it up, even though the other side's going down. And when it's going down, we'll call it down, even though the other side's going up. So for, for, your, for your scapula, we picked the acromion process, the side of your shoulder. And we said, when that's going up, even though this other stuff is going down, we're going to call that an upward rotation, because it is rotating. And when this is going down, we're going to call it a downward rotation. So that's just the way we talk about it, because we otherwise we'd call it twisting left and right, and that doesn't quite make sense on a body. So, so we just call this upward rotation, downward rotation. And we have to do that because anytime something's going down, there's another part going up. So we so end up. Is the coracoid process always the point? Actually, it's funny you said coracoid process because that would work too. This is the acromion process, but guess what? Don't be sorry, because guess what? It matches with the coracoid, and you could use that too. When the acromion process or the coracoid process is going up, it's an upward rotation. Okay, so that's always the point. Always. Monday through Sunday, 365 days a week. No, I'm serious. Though it really is always the point. We just chose this. We just picked that point. When we get to hips, we're going to pick another point, because they can rotate too. And we just pick a point, and we always, but we always use that point. Like every doctor, every physical therapist, we don't change it with different muscles or anything. It's the acromion process. And the beauty of this is, the beauty of this is, when you start to bring your arm out and really bring it up, you rotate up. Because we're using this point here to use that. So what's cool is up is up. <laughs> when my arm is up, I'm rotating up. When my arm is down, I'm starting to rotate down. Yeah. I hope I didn't make that more confusing than necessary. So it's like you're not focusing on like the main part of the scapula where it's going. You're just looking at the the, the lateral, the end part of it. Yeah. You're so just I looking. have a question. So if I'm doing an ab flexion, does that mean that my scapula is rotating down? Yeah, it could. So um, uh, it de definitely doesn't mean it's going up. So here's why I mean it could. I can do and adduction without moving my scapula at all. This is me adducting my glenohumeral joint. You guys are starting to ask, by the way, really advanced questions. That's why I'm having to give you very confusing answers. So uh, it's great. So this is my glenohumeral joint doing an adduction, right? I added it back to my body, correct? Okay, well, I'm gonna explain the rest of your question, but I'm just asking, this is an adduction, right? Okay, this is me doing this, boom. I don't have to rotate my scapula to do that, but I'll tell you what, if I'm up here, my arm can't come up past here without rotating up. So up here, 
The only way to get back down is to rotate my scapula down and adduct my glenohumeral joint. So I'm doing two things at once. So what you said was essentially correct. But I'm saying right here I don't have to do it. I can not move my scapula if I don't want to. But once I start rotating my scapula up, now I have to adduct my arm and downwardly rotate my scapula. That's why these questions are so complex that you're asking, by the way. You guys are asking in kind of advanced kinesiology stuff. This is fantastic that you're even thinking about this at this stage of the game. Mandy had a question as well, Ms. Stanley. Yeah, what was your question, Ms. Stanley? When doing a pull-up, does the scapula rotate? Yes. Does it go upward and downward? Yes. So, so, all right, bear with me, okay? This is the left arm, everybody. I'm not even going to talk about what happens at the elbow because obviously stuff happens at the elbow when you're doing a pull-up, okay? But let's just talk about what happens to this arm because this arm has to come down, right? So when I'm doing a pull-up, when, when I'm hanging there, yes, thank you, Ms. Hanson, when you are hanging there, my arms are way up high like this. My scapula is rotated upwards, and my arm is, is way up, way, way abducted, right? Way up like this. In order to do the pull-up, I have to adduct my glenohumeral joint while downwardly rotating my scapula. And believe it or not, we don't think about it, but my lower, um, not just my lats, but my lower trapezius is also pulling my scapula down to make sure it doesn't rip off my back. When you do a pull-up, you use more muscles in your upper body than you could possibly imagine. It will later be a question that I ask you, not on a test, don't worry, but like in class, like tell me the muscles involved in a pull-up because there's about 17. So the main motion though would just be the lats and of course the teres major pulling the arm down and then, uh, then lower traps um, keeping your your shoulder blade on your back, and rhomboids helping it to uh, rotate down. Your rhomboids really act in there and helping it rotate back down. So the main, the main movement is adduction of the glenohumeral joint, downward rotation of the scapular thoracic joint. That's the movements. But, but there's a bit of a depression, believe it or not, because if you think about it, when you're hanging there, your shoulder blade also goes up your back. So it's got to pull back down, Downwardly rotate, pull the arm back down. So in order to do a pull-up, you really have to do a depression of the scapula, a downward rotation of the scapula, and an adduction of the glenohumeral joint. And there's about 17 muscles that help you do that. And I don't, 17 might not be an exaggeration. It really is close to that. I'm just guessing really fast, but cool. Did that answer your question at all, Ms. Stanley? Yes, it did. Cool. Uh, I'm just glad I was able to catch it all because for part of it, I was... I accidentally threw my computer at a spider. I got scared. <laughs> Sorry. I, got, I just, I accidentally threw my computer at a spider. Oh my gosh. Yeah, go ahead. My, my hand. I just, I just, like, I just picture your boyfriend coming home and going, going, what happened to the computer? There was a spider. Of course. Okay. All right, everybody. Great, great, great questions. Okay. <clears throat> and we will get to all this. We're building blocks, but... It shows a real understanding that you're, you're asking them, so thank you. So do we basically understand that the rhomboids kind of go at this diagonal, right? They go from C7 to T5. They insert on the medial border of the scapula from the inferior angle to a little bit above, right across from the spine of the scapula. Because they go at this angle, they can retract or adduct the scapula. They can elevate it or lift it up a little bit. And because they're pulling on the lower portion, they can actually cause a downward rotation that you actually would use in a pull-up. Does it at least make sense? I don't care if you memorize it. I don't care. Look, I just want you to be like, yeah, I kind of feel that. I'm feeling you. Yeah? Let me see some nods. I got a thumbs up. Nods. Good. Okay. A little flexion of the neck. Flexion, extension. Flexion, extension. Good. Okay. Let's go on to another muscle. And I think you're learning my style now. You know what? We're going to come back to these. You know I'm going to ask you about them, right? Um, 
this is uh, this is somebody just showing you about palpating them. Uh, you can't you can find them by the way. You can feel them through the traps, and you can actually tell they're rhomboids. But it's a little tricky. Remember, muscle is meat, so you're going through one steak to try to find a different steak. And let me tell you something really neat that happens with the rhomboids. If you are rubbing down somebody's back, you know how you guys do those strokes down somebody's back, right? And if you're doing them deeply, which I know you are because nobody pays to be tickled, you are doing your massage deeply. When you come across these, sometimes you'll feel this like bump, but a 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 bump. In fact, some people are even like, oh, those are knots. They're not necessarily knots. There are you running across fiber going a different direction. The fiber is running down the back. These are called your erector spinae muscles. You've got these muscles that run down the back, your erector spinae muscles. We haven't learned about them yet, but they run down the You're going with those fibers, but you get to these fibers, and it's just like running across your fingers. It goes ba bump, ba bump, ba bump, ba bump. You're running across the rhomboids. Lots, by the way, lots of massage therapists run across a muscle going the other direction. They go, oh, that's a knot. They go back, pluck, 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 that's a knot. Not necessarily. Feel, feel along this way. You might find out that it's just a muscle running the other direction. In fact, a lot of times. But that's the rhomboids. Yeah. Just check it out. Yeah. Very cool. Um, and it's one of the reasons, I, I think you guys have already been doing this, you grab the scapula. You actually grab the medial board of the scapula and pull on it because you can stretch out the rhomboids. Probably one of my favorite moves. And I don't want to disappoint you now, but I've only got about 10 things I like to do. And then I do them over and over again. Um, because really, I think that you think you're going to go to school and we're going to show you something magical. But really, we're just going to get you lots of practice at rubbing lots of different stuff, right? Hopefully with finesse and hopefully you're precise and hopefully you know you're on the wrong voids when you're on them and hopefully you know how to stretch them and all that kind of stuff. But really, there's only so many ways to rub a body. But one of my favorite things to do is grab onto stuff and stretch it. Because if the action of this is an adduction, I like to abduct it. And by the way, this is not an exaggeration. I will grab that thing. If you get on my table someday, I'll come in and demo. I'm going to pull your arm off your body. Yeah. It's actually very hard to do. Your arms are glued on your body really well. But I, that's why I do it. I'll grab it. You can actually pull somebody off the table before you pull their arm off. Um, and I've stretched that thing. Because I'm stretching all your rhomboids at once. And your middle traps. It's a good move. Yeah. I like it. Cool, cool, cool. Rhomboids. Love it. Live it. Okay, so I picked this muscle next on purpose because I actually know what I'm doing. Um, but I need a different color tape. Okay. So this next muscle on page 83, 84 is called the levator scapula. Levator kind of sounds like elevator. What do you suppose, um, Miss Melodic, what do you suppose the levator scapula does? Um, it elevates. Elevates what? The scapula. Yeah, it's exactly 100% correct. Thank you, Miss Melodic. Um, it does exactly that. Its name says it all. It is the elevator of the scapula. It elevates the scapula. Yeah. Miss Hunter, can you show me an elevation of your scapula? Maybe not. All right. Oh, there you are. Hello. Hello. Can you yeah, I can see can you. Hear me? Yep. Okay, elevation of the scapula. <laughs> or maybe, um, maybe you don't know. Um, <laughs> is it? I mean, I don't know. I think I can think of this. It's hotter. I was gonna move my shoulders. I was moving my shoulders up, but I thought. It's good. Isn't that the traps? <laughs> well, you are a very bright young lady. Yes, it is the traps, but it's also the levator scapula. <laughs> So, there's always one more, more than one muscle that does stuff, but yeah. Oh, okay. So, this one, the elevator of the scapula, yeah. In fact, the levator scapula does something very similar to which part of the traps? Which part of the traps? Um, 
Miss Hunter? Oh, you asked me a question. Sorry. I'm oh, sorry. No, don't be. It's the internet um, connection. Repeat the question, please. The levator scapula does similar action to which muscle that we've already learned about? Which part of the traps? Which part of the traps? Uh, the upper fibers. Yeah, 100% correct. That's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. Right, and it looks a little bit like the upper fibers, right? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, sure. Kind of. I don't know. Sure. Awesome. Okay. Um, let's talk about this muscle. The reason I, I picked it next is because it too it too inserts into the medial board of the scapula. So we have the teres major here, teres minor, and now the last part, kind of between the upper spine of the scapula and the superior angle of the scapula is levator scapula. It's like this. It's literally like this. That's our little levator scapula. It goes up there like that. So we're teaching you this way because we want you to know when you grab this medial border of the scapula on somebody, we want you to know what you're grabbing. You're reaching through the traps, mainly the middle. You're grabbing the rhomboids major, rhomboids minor, and levator scapula, the insertions for all those at once. Levator scapula goes and hooks into the side of the neck. And it hooks into things that are called transverse processes. All right. This is a little, these are vertebrae. The spinous processes were these things that stick out your back. You feel them when you massage people, or you're not supposed to feel them when you massage people, but you can easily feel them when you massage people. Transverse processes, like the transverse plane that we learned about, go out the side. So if I were a vertebrae, this would be my spinous process and these would be my transverse processes. Right? They go off the side. You've got them on the side, you've got them all the way down your back, but you have them on the side of your neck. These are little things on the side of your neck and all the way down your back. And they're called transverse processes on a vertebrae. Look at this vertebrae going down. This is a spinous process off to the side of these transverse processes. And it likes to grab onto the first four spinous processes of your cervical vertebrae. Yeah? So, Miss Monreal, you are my vertebrae expert. So, Miss Monreal, if it likes to, if it likes to, um, have an origin of the first four spinous processes of my cervical vertebrae. Which cervical vertebrae are those? Wait, are we talking about um, Terry's major? Uh, no. We're talking about levator scapula. Oh. But you don't even okay. have to look at that. You just have to yep. listen to me. If if okay. it if it if its origin is the first first four cervical vertebrae, what is its origin? What are the first four cervical vertebrae? C1, C2, C3, and C4. Yeah, thank you. Cool. So it grabs onto these. Yes. It grabs onto those. Okay. So its most obvious action, because it looks kind of like the upper traps, its most obvious action, Ms. Torres, what's its most obvious action, Ms. Torres, of this levator scapula? Um, to elevate the scapula? Yeah, just like the upper fibers of the trapezius. Yeah. The second part's a little trickier, but because it's grabbing from up here, right, it too is running at an angle here and can help with a downward rotation. Because it's lifting the opposite side up, it can cause the acrobium process 
or the coracoid process in this petri to go down. So it causes a downward rotation. Because it's on the side of the head too, it can cause something called a lateral flexion. So it's hooking in the side of my neck. This is lateral flexion. I'm flexing laterally. Lateral flexion. Lateral flexion. I have to laterally flex to get out of a lateral flexion. Lateral flex. So it's going like this. So can you see how it could do that? It can lift one shoulder up, but if that shoulder stays down, it'll pull my head over. That's really what your body does, by the way. It locks this shoulder down and pulls your head over if it needs to. Or it locks your head down and pulls your shoulder up. But that's called lateral flexion. Yeah? Mr. Kandaris, will you show me a lateral flexion of your neck, sir, please? Mr. Kadaris, will you show me a lateral flexion of your neck, sir, please? Uh. <clears throat> Can, I need you in the full picture. I'm just having a hard time seeing you. Thank you. Okay. Lateral flexion. Lateral flexion. Yeah. Of the neck. Cool. What muscle could be responsible for that, sir? Uh, the scapula. Thank you, sir. Awesome. Levator scapula can cause a lateral flexion of the neck or elevation of the shoulders, right? This is when it's working unilaterally, just one side. If it's working bilaterally, that's not going to work, right? In fact, bilaterally, it's likely to lift up my shoulders. So, this next part's tricky. It can also cause a rotation of the head. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Oh, please, please, please. Answer, ask, ask, ask. So, you said... It you said it elevates the shoulder or the scapula or both? Uh, if I heard you right, you're saying, did I say it elevates the shoulder or the scapula or both? Is that what you said? You said it elevates the shoulders. So sometimes that's why we get confused because we're talking about the shoulders, then we're talking about the scapula. So it elevates the scapula for sure, but it also elevates the shoulders or when you say it, what do you mean by shoulder? What do you mean by shoulder? You said. I know I said you shoulder. Said you said elevate the shoulder. Okay, but what do you mean by shoulder? This, like my shoulder. Okay, but so if you hit your shoulder right here, tap your shoulder right here, what bone are you hitting? Uh, chromium. Yeah, and then chromium is part of your what? Scapula. Okay. So, so these are kind of the same thing, aren't they? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, is it just the same thing? Do we say scapula? Do we say shoulder? Oh, sorry. I'm Do sorry, Ms. Torres. I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to be difficult. I, I, I understand now. I'm sorry. If you, uh, I'm mixing terms to try to make things easier, but maybe I'm making them harder because we're starting to learn all this really big stuff. I would say it elevates the scapula. You're right. Shoulder is, shoulder, you're right, can be ambiguous. I, if we want to be really technical, we'll never use the term shoulder. It's either, either moves the scapula or moves the glenohumeral humeral joint. Like this muscle doesn't do that, but my point is this is the only stuff that goes on here. Either your scapula is moving somewhere or your glenohumeral joints moving somewhere or both are moving together, but you're right. Shoulder is a little ambiguous. Okay. And I'm sorry, I bet, yeah, it lifts your shoulder okay, up. And it, it does, it lifts your shoulders up, but you're right. I'll use, I'll, you guys are doing much better. Expect. I'll just use technical terms. This elevates your scapula. You are absolutely right. Thank you for the question. Very good point. This elevates your scapula. So I'm going to shoulder for somebody who maybe doesn't know the anatomy. Yeah. Sense so, yeah. And so, by the way, I don't know if you guys noticed, but when we first started talking, not today, but like a week or two ago, I used more like arms and shoulder terms and started interjecting these terms. And now we're kind of transitioning more and more to, like, I didn't even call this glenohumeral humeral joint in the beginning. I was just like, show me a flexion of your arm, right? Show me a flexion of your arm. But now I'm like, show me a flexion of your glenohumeral humeral joint. That's actually much more technically correct. Um, and you bring up a really interesting point. When I'm talking to clients, 
I think it's more impressive and kinder to not say things like glenohumeral joint. I think it, it sounds like I'm showing off. And I think if I really know my soft stuff, I wouldn't be showing off. Does that make sense? And so, and I think it's disrespectful. Like, um, if, if you speak Spanish and English, and you know I don't speak Spanish, don't speak to me in Spanish, right? Um, and there's nothing wrong with speaking Spanish, but my point is you would, you would respect the fact that I'm ignorant to that, and you would talk to me in English. And so I do that with my clients. If they're like, oh, what, what muscle's doing that? I'll be like, oh, it's a little levator scapula. It kind of lifts your shoulder up. Um, and if you want to know more, I'll tell you. And I'll, well, I'll go nuts then. Then I'll show off. But you're right. And I don't tell clients, like, lay supine or prone. I'm like, lay face down on your belly. Lay face up on your back. You know, so you're absolutely right. I would change the language back to shoulder, to arm, to whatever. Well said. And then if your client was like, let's say like a physical therapist and they were speaking that way, you would, you would use the like technical terms for it. They would, and it's, does that make sense? Oh, I'm, I'm smiling for, uh, it makes perfect sense. I'm smiling, Ms. Janas, because actually, um, the most important skill in massage therapy has nothing to do with rubbing and nothing to do with anatomy. It's what we call soft skills. And what you're displaying are soft skills. Soft skills are how to understand the person you're dealing with. And you're absolutely right. So if you're, um, I don't know, this person who's an accountant, I'm just, I'm generalizing. You're an accountant, I might call it a shoulder. You're a physical therapist, it's going to be glenohumeral joint or scapulothoracic joint, or I'm going to use all the terms because it'll actually help build rapport between us because I'm going to speak the language they speak. And the way you're thinking is, is just fantastic because actually your ability to connect with people and work with them is so much more important than even your massage skills. So I'm, I'm going to tangent here for just a second, but they do surveys on doctors and ask customers, like client, you know, patients, like you know, about how they feel about their doctors and stuff. And some doctors with the worst records for actually helping people, but have the best bedside manner, get the best surveys. Their 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 patients think they are the best doctor, because you don't know. All they can judge them on is their personality. And then some of the best doctors out there that are kind of rude or abrupt or don't explain things or don't connect well, they get very poor surveys and they're, they're, their patients think they're not good doctors and yet they have some of the highest outcomes. They save the most lives, right? And more importantly than that, the doctors that get sued the most have the worst bedside manner. The doctors that get sued the least are the nicest ones. I know a doctor who actually says, don't, don't call me Dr. So-and-so. Call me Mary. She has all of her patients call her Mary. And I'm like, why do you do that? She goes, because nobody sues Mary. You sue Dr. So-and-so, right? So all these are bedside manner things. And to be honest with you, massage is definitely therapeutic rubbing and stretching and opening people's bodies up and unpinching their nerves and making them live better lives and athletes have better performance. 50% of it. The other 50% is people actually want to be around somebody who's nice and they're going to spend an hour of quality time with you and they really like it when that person doesn't talk down to them and they can relate to them and somebody else is making it all about them. So these are fantastic things you're bringing up. You're absolutely right. And so I change my language radically depending on who I'm talking to. Radically. Yeah. Because I'm there for you. You're paying me 100 bucks an hour. It's all about you. All about you. Never about me. Not when you're paying me 100 bucks an hour. Get my whole, get my whole attention. There. Thank you. Sorry, guys, to go off on a tangent, but that's something I really believe in. It's something I've seen in the industry. I've seen eh, massage therapists with a great personality do really well, really well. And I've seen really, really good massage therapists that were kind of jerks do very badly. You just can't, you can't. You got to be, you got to be phenomenal with people. Start practicing now. That's why I get excited when the class gets along well, because it means you guys have the ability to get along with strangers, because you don't get to pick your best friend to work on. You just get Joe Schmo walks to the door. You've got to be able to get along with anybody for an hour, and they're your best friend for one hour. One hour. Or two hours. Whatever. Cool. All right. So we got the levator scapula. Um, it also can create a rotation of the head, and it's actually funny, Ms. Giannis, we're going back to you because you're my ro head rotator expert. 
So, um, with the trapezius, we had this muscle that kind of grabbed here, and when it, when it contracted, it pulled my head to the opposite side. This is very hard to visualize, but this darn levator scapula is kind of behind you. So when it contracts, it actually pulls the head to the same side. It's really hard to visualize, but because it's be the way it's behind me, it actually, and the fact that it's out to the side here, it can actually help me turn my head to the same side. And I don't really know a way to help really help you visualize that, except to say that I'm here, so if I pull on this, you're going to get a little bit of this action going here. And it's part, part of it's because there's a greater angle here. It's more in back and it's going more in front by grabbing on the side of the neck. And it's going to help the neck turn to the same side that's contracting. Okay, I have to understand this. So do I. So Let's try to do it I'm together. To wrap my mind around this. Okay, so if I'm pulling to the same side, okay, that's the levator scapula contracting, but is it still the thing with the trapezius where the opposite side then is doing its thing? Yeah. Okay. So everybody hang with me for this wild roller coaster ride. Miss Monreal, you're 100% correct. So I'll say it and then I'll, then I'll show it. Okay. So to turn my head to the left, my brain would contract my left levator scapula and my right upper trapezius. Okay. And let me, let me show you really quickly why. If you guys can see this, I'm going to exaggerate these muscles. This is not how they are, but it will help you see this. The levator scapula essentially does this, and the trapezius essentially does this. So do you see how they make an X? So when the trapezius pulls, the head goes to the opposite side, when the levator scapula pulls, the head goes this side. It's because of their angles. So I hope you can see that. When the trapezius pulls, when the trapezius pulls, this head won't turn. That's part of the problem. When the trapezius pulls, the head goes to the opposite side. When the levator scapula pulls, it's kind of grabbing in front of the head. It's grabbing the neck, but it's still grabbing in front of the head. It pulls to the same side. So, okay. back to my, really quick though, I want you to ask another yeah. question, but one second. So when I'm turning to my left, my levator scapula on my left side pulls, and my trapezius on my right side pulls. They contract, I should say. Now, what's your, what were you going to say? So, then, is the trapezius supporting the levator scapula, even though it's the opposite side, or is it, it's not fighting it, is it? Right. So, in this scenario... Um, they are synergists. They are supporting okay. one another. They are working in symphony. They are synergists. They're working together and they support each other. Right. Now, could the trapezius and the levator scapula on the same side fight each other? Yes, they could. Because this one, because they'd be, they could fight on the same side if they wanted to. But like in what type of movement would that take place? Uh, in neither. So it'd be just if I had a tight neck here, maybe my levator okay. scapula would be turning me this way and my trapezius would be trying to turn me back this way. Okay. I know it's kind of a confusing concept, but you could, your body, like if I'm tight over here, my body's not going to let me walk around like this. So what happens is this side tightens up to try to get my head back straight. Your body's okay. trying to stay so, in good posture. So in this so case, not, Oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Okay, so in this case, if, if these are made-up scenarios. I don't know if this actually happens, but stuff like this happens. So in this case, if my levator scapula was tight on the left side, my head's trying to turn left, maybe my trapezius on, on my left side would try to turn it back right to kind of hold it back in place. So it's not necessarily going to fight itself in an action, more so in just trying to create a balance in maybe a tight muscle type situation? Yeah. Okay. But, but remember actions again. Like right now, you don't know if I'm abducting or adducting. I'm not doing okay. anything right now. The because minute it's neutral. The, it's neutral. The minute I well, it doesn't even matter. Right now, you don't know if I'm abducting or or, or adducting. Okay. The minute I start moving this way, the action is abducting. 
Now the action is adducting. And so if these two actions fight each other, in fact, in order to hold my arm out like this, they kind of have to fight each other a little bit to kind of hold it still. Okay. When a bodybuilder is flexing, they're not just flexing their bicep, they're flexing their tricep to fight that so that you can see their bicep, right? Otherwise, their arm would come all the way over here, but they're stopping their arm from coming all the way over here. They're fighting themselves. They're actually, right now, I am actually performing a flexion and extension at the same time. Right now, I'm not doing anything. Right now, I'm performing a flexion and extension at the same time. That's what's giving me this muscle. Does that make sense? I'm trying to flex, and I'm trying to extend at the same time. That's why I'm flexing. I'm sorry to use the word flexing because it has nothing to do with flexion, but you understand what I'm saying? That's why I'm showing off these beautiful guns, right? But this, I'm not doing anything. This nice flabby stuff here, I'm just, that's just, I'm just standing there. But the minute I try to flex and extend at the same time, then I get a, a battle going. Now, for a bodybuilder, the battle is to show off their, their guns. But, but for us, the battle might be a tight neck. I might be getting this kind of battle. Ugh. That kind of thing. Cool? Great, great, great questions. How are we feeling about all that? I'm getting some blank stares. I don't know if screens are paused or... I mean, I feel like it's a <laughs> lot, but I feel like uh, I'm grasping it, and yeah. I know that I'll get it more as we go further down the road. Yeah, and by the way, I don't want you to 100% get it. I just want you to kind of understand this big cross here, right? If I yeah. pull on the if I pull on the forehead, the forehead's gonna forehead's gonna come towards me. If I pull on the back head, the forehead's gonna go away, and the back of the head's gonna come towards me. And that's this kind of action. I just want you to understand the pulling thing. Okay. And it's very hard to visualize. And we are talking about subtle little movements, and we're learning very rapidly that it's not done by one muscle anymore. It's not like the trapezius is the only muscle that elevates the scapula. We've now learned about the levator scapula too. And they all do slightly different things, and they work together in little nuances. And the reason it's so confusing to us is our brain takes care of all of this for us. It learned it when you were a baby. And literally to walk across the floor, you have to flex and release and contract like 35 muscles, maybe 55 muscles. And your brain does all of that. And not even the whole muscle, like certain fibers and everything. It does it perfectly. And that's what you learned when you were a baby. And you were walking around and falling down. Your brain was wiring and learning that. It's called a subroutine. And your brain does it. So now I just tell my brain, pick this thing up. And it does it. So the levator scapula and the trapezius work together to make an action. Is that correct? Quite often. Right? Yes. Um, I, I don't know... Miss Petrie, if that's true all the time, but yes, quite often they would work together to make an action. So, so let's talk about some of those really quickly. My upper traps working bilaterally on both sides and my la levator scapula working bilaterally on both sides would do this, elevate my scapula. Yeah, and I'm sure my brain would have them work together. I don't know how much. I don't know if one gets to, you know what I mean? But yeah, they both do the same thing there, yes. When I turn my head... They unilaterally work together, but this is where it gets confusing. <laughs> the trapezius pulls here on this side to turn my head, and the levator scapula pulls on this side to turn my head this way. And that's what I was trying to show with this silly tape. The trapezius on this side would pull in the back of my head to turn it, and the levator scapula would kind of pull in the front of my head to turn it. So. These are kind of helping twist me this way. So when you think about it, if you're turning your to the left, the left side of the um, levator scapula is turning there, and then the right of your trapezius is helping to turn your head left, right? If what you just said was the to turn left, the left levator scapula is contracting and the right trapezius is contracting, then yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. You are right. Yeah. And by the way, if it makes you guys feel any better, when I'm working on somebody, I don't think about this. Like, I need you to understand it. We need to kind of learn it. But I don't sit there actually and think about that. All I think about is that the trapezius and levator scapula help turn a head. Because then I can wiggle your head and I can feel the muscles moving. And that's what we're really going to use this for later. I don't sit there and go, I'm turning the head to the right. So therefore, I'm doing this thing with this levator and the trapezius on the other side. That's too much in my brain, too. 
it's good to understand. But later, we just want you to understand they rotate the head because later when you're working on somebody's neck, you might rotate the head to activate these muscles and massage them better. That's why we care. So if you walked up to me in the street and said, levator scapula, which side turns the head? I'd have to sit there for five minutes and think about it. I think I could answer it because I, I know the angle it runs and stuff, but I'd be like, oh gosh, is it the same side or the opposite side? Because I don't memorize my action. So I'd have to think, well, it's going diagonal. It's kind of in front. And I'd be like, finally, I'd say same side. I just don't, we're not going to stick that in your head 100%. We just need to kind of understand the concept. Okay. How are we feeling? Anybody want to I'm looking at stuff. So if it's and trapezius work together, yes. Frustrated a little right now? Yes, I don't blame you. Yes, your brain should hurt, Miss Stanley. Yes. Yeah. Miss Hunter, you're absolutely right. Yes, I love it. Rhomboids. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Brain hurts so much knowledge. I know. I know. Your head, Ms. Cooper, when this class started, weighed 8 pounds, but now weighs 8.5 pounds. And by the time you graduate, it's going to be 10.5 pounds. Yeah. Are you brushing your teeth while learning? That's good. Oral hygiene is important. We will eventually get to the muscles that allow you to do that. Okay. Okay. Well, moving right along. Um, so... Just a little, little, little tidbits about the levator scapula. Little tidbits. Back to this little red muscle that attached to the neck. A couple of tidbits about it. It's basically underneath the trapezius. Basically underneath the trapezius, all right? It's basically deep. There are places where it peaks out, but it's basically deep to the trapezius if you're working on the back of somebody. All right? And it hooks into the side of the neck. Well, what comes out the sides of your spine everywhere, all the way down your spine? What comes out the sides of your spine, anybody? Water? Chocolate? Nerves. Nerves! Nerve plexes, we call them. Nerves is 100% correct, you're right. But nerve plexes, which are big bundle. The, the spine is a big bug bundle. By the way, here's a vertebrae, right? That's your spine. This big thing that runs down through your vertebrae, from your brain, all the way down to your tailbone, and out the sides are nerve plexes, like the branches of a tree. And by the way, not, I mean, almost identical to branches of a tree. You got the trunk, you got the branches of the tree, and what comes off branches? Littler branches. What comes off littler branches? Littler branches. What comes off littler branches? Littler branches. So these plexes go out like roots down to every little thing down to my fingertip, right? Does anybody, Miss Montreal, since you're on fire right now, where do the nerves, nerve plexes of my neck tend to go? What part of my body do they tend to connect to? Uh, arms. Yes, 100% correct, yes. By the way, that knowledge right there will serve you well for a long, long time. So people with neck problems might be experiencing arm problems. That does not mean everybody with an arm problem is having a neck problem, but they might be. Because a pinched nerve of the neck will give you pain in the arm. Anyway, just remember this is a sensitive area. You can rub sides of necks. They're not as delicate as you think. But just remember there are nerve plexes coming out here where the levator scapula hooks into. So you can push down on this and somebody will say, my arm feels like it's going numb. Don't worry, you haven't killed them and you haven't paralyzed their arm for life. Just move your hand to a new location. They'll be fine. But that's very normal. You might pinch a nerve by pushing on it. Yeah. Miss... Miss Stanley. Miss Stanley, I know your brain hurts. Yeah. Uh, Miss Stanley. Um, so... If I press on this area, somebody's arm could kind of go numb. Does that mean if the levator scapula is tight, that people could experience arm numbness and, and pain or tingling or whatever? Um, I suppose so, but... You suppose so, right, ma'am? 
Okay. <laughs> so this tiny muscle, this tiny muscle, when it's tight, often pinches on the nerve plexus because it inserts into the sides of the neck where the nerves, nerve plexus come out. So this little levator scapula, this little tiny muscle, and it's tiny, it's thin and mm -hmm. tiny, gives people a lot of problems. Yeah, I know the feeling. Yeah. You probably know the feeling right now in class because you're like this, you're hunched over your computer, you're stressed out, we're like this, and my levator scapula is activated and now it's kind of pinched on some nerves in my neck and now I'm getting some pain down my arm. and it's, That's very common. This is yeah, very common. Yeah, people have real pain, like if they get whiplash, is usually that muscle. Uh, that is one of the muscles that gets affected for sure. It's tiny and it gets, yes. By the way, when you get whiplash, though, other things happen too, like a lot of ligaments that just attach bone to bone get stretched because the, the whiplashing is so strong the muscles can't handle it. Um, and those are even a bigger problem because what happens is the muscles repair fairly quickly, but all the ligaments get pulled, and that's a problem. Yeah. Not to mention their brain sloshing around their head that fast. That is a problem too. But yes, all sorts of stuff happens, yeah, when you get whiplash. But yes, very well said. Um, and by the way, you can find the levator scapula. Let me give you a little clue before we move on. This top of the scapula is kind of where it hooks to, right? Right up in here. And this is actually very hard to find. Because people, when they feel a back, you feel this and you think this is the top of the scapula. But it, it, this other part kind of curves in. And if you kind of reach up here and move the scapula around, you can find the superior angle. And between the superior angle on this medial side here is levator scapula, and you can find it. You can actually reach underneath the traps and find it. You'll know when you find it on your partner because they will say, if you ever touch me like that again, I will kill you. <laughs> no, there's nothing wrong with doing it, but it's sensitive on people. I work it. I want you to find it too. I work it. But my point is it's sensitive. People aren't used to having them somebody reach underneath their, their traps and find this edge here, this upper edge. Down here, it's fine. If you try to work your hand up into here, it's actually really sensitive. But you'll find the levator scapula, and you can even kind of trace it up into the neck. Or you'll think you'll find it. By the way, I want to reassure you all that every time I'm on a muscle, I think I'm on a muscle. I'm never 100% sure. Once I think I found the muscle, then I use these actions that we've learned to figure out if I'm on it. I move the muscle around, I move the bone around, and if the muscle moves like that muscle is supposed to move because where it's attached, I'm like, now I'm on it. So I use this anatomy and the actions of the muscle to figure out if I'm actually on the right muscle. But it's always a guessing game. I don't get to pull back their skin and find out. Cool? All right. Fantastic. Okay. Two more muscles. This next one is amazing and really important. Um, serratus anterior. Serratus anterior. This is not the serratus anterior. I want to be very clear about how this works. So bear with me. I'm sorry. This is kind of important. Actually, maybe I can show you the skeleton. I don't know a good way to do this. All right. These are the rhomboids here, right? The rhomboids hooked to the medial border of scapula. Follow me closely. I hope you're watching the camera now. This is actually very hard to show. The serratus anterior hooks to the medial border of the scapula too, but in front. So it meets the rhomboids. The rhomboids are coming off like this. This thing's coming in front like this. Serratus anterior. Rhomboids. They connect. Is it going underneath? Yes, it is. It's going underneath. Thank you. It is going under, underneath, so it's rubbing against the subscapularis. I'm shocked you guys are nodding because I think this is really complicated to visualize. I'm really glad. But so my rhomboids are here. They connect to the medial border. Serratus anterior connects the medial border too, but from in front. And it hooks into my ribs, kind of like my hand right now. Kind of. Yeah. So, rhomboids can retract or adduct my scapula 
What do you suppose serratus anterior can do? Protractor abductus. Thank you, Ms. Giannis. Protractor abductus scapula. And they wrap around the ribs. If you get a client with really tight shoulders sometime, really tight shoulders, ask them if it's hard for them to take a deep breath. 50% of the time, I'm guessing, I'm not quite sure about that, 50% of the time they'll go, oh yeah, it does, I didn't notice that. Their rhomboids are pulling their shoulders back, their serratus anterior is pulling their shoulders forward, and they're all clamping down on their chest. So they've got a belt, they've got a belt of the serratus anterior and the rhomboids wrapping around their rib cage, and it makes it hard to take a deep breath. And, and by the way, when you're stressed out, and it's hard to take a deep breath. That can add a little bit to your stress too, even if you're not quite aware that you can do that. So serratus anterior is extremely important because it can argue with the rhomboids. This doesn't have to, in a good working body, it just protracts and the rhomboids retract, but it can argue with. So Mr. Ibarra said, um, and this was a random thing that he was saying, that if somebody has a winged scapula, that usually their uh, serratus anterior muscles are weak. Yeah. So is that because it's not holding it tight? Yes. He's 100% correct, by the way. 100% um, correct. I don't see a lot of winged scapulas in this society because people are usually so tense their scapula is pulled down to their back. But because the scap because this muscle reaches underneath here, it pulls your scapula close to your back and to your ribs. That's part of its job, actually, is to lock down your scapula. If it was weak, your scapula could kind of wing out. But you just don't see it very often because most people are tense and their scapula is pulled down to their back. But he's 100% correct. Um, we don't realize that, but even when I type at a keyboard, my serratus anterior locks my scapula down to my back so that it doesn't wiggle around so I can keep my hands still. I know so my, I, ha I do have a friend who has a wing scapula only on one side, so is it damaged on that side then? Yeah, so I'm not qualified to answer that question, oh, but I'll give a stab at it anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm just wondering. I just, yeah. want, I just want to be like clear, like I, I'm guessing, and that's what I tell clients too, I'm happy to guess with you. Um, the fact that it's on one side always concerns me. I don't mean like life or death concerns me, but what I meant was this concerns me more about somebody than this. Right? Um, I'd like you at least to be tense in a balanced manner. Uh, the fact that one side is like that makes me wonder if there's nerve damage on that side. Like maybe a nerve got pinched or something on that side or damaged and so the muscle's not getting the right signal and that's why one side is so out of balance with the other because it's just, it's unusual. So that's one thought that goes through my head. It is possible that one side is weak um, and there are ways to strengthen your serratus anterior, easy ways. Um, but that's the first thought that goes through my head is some type of nerve situation because mm. it's just unusual to see one side different. I've seen both sides. By the way, I, I got to be very careful what I say here. All sides are always different. Nobody's balanced down the middle ever. Nobody has the same length arms. Nobody has the same length legs. There's always one side of the body that's tighter than the other, always. But dramatic differences, dramatic differences are a sign of something kind of to look at. There's stuff I look at. And and the scapula popping up on one side but not the other, I don't know. Um, I would wonder if there's like some nerve pinched in that area or something. Yeah. The first thing I would do, by the way, is see can they engage it. Can they, can they, what you do is you get them to hold out their arms stiff like this and just move their scapula forward. That's what all the, all the serratus anterior does is pull, protract my scapula. Doesn't move my glenohumeral joint around, protract my scapula, right? It's kind of the point Ms. Torres is making about the difference between the shoulders and stuff. But anyway, protract my scapula, and you should be able to feel it engage under here. You should be able to put your hand there, and if they're pushing against something with their fist here, you should feel those ribs kind of flex up. Um, and if it's not really engaging, or if they can't really push out with one side, well, actually, if it's not engaging, because there's other muscles that help it push out, but still... That's one of the things I'd look for. I'd be curious about okay. it. Yeah. Interesting. It's very interesting, and it's a cool question because 
even though you don't diagnose as massage therapist, you have to guess all the time as massage therapist because what do you work on? Like your friend doesn't come in with a winged scapula and I start rubbing her nose. I got to work on something. And so the first thing I'm going to look at is like, does the, the serratus anterior engage? Can she flex it consciously? If she can flex it consciously on the side that's winging, then I might go, okay, maybe it's just weak. And there are exercises for that. So when I, you're working that, is it different when you do it on like a guy versus a girl? Because obviously they have more fat tissue there because of their breasts, right? Uh, uh, no, actually. Thank you for asking though. Um, I appreciate you bringing this up. So the serratus anterior is not quite where the breast is. It's all, it's, it's side. And I, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean this like I'm trying to be like, I'm very respectful about all this stuff, but it's like a little bit of side breast, right? But it's not really under it. It's actually on the side and the ribs. It is very close to the breast though. And so it's easy to work. You can work it on anybody, but you got to be careful, right? And by the way, a little caution to the ladies, believe it or not, don't assume that just because it's another lady you're working on th that you don't have to be as careful as like a guy might have to be. Because some people, everybody's just different. You never know. That's all I got to say. Just be careful. But please, by the way, also, don't be scared to work in these areas because some massage therapists get so scared about breasts and groin area that they don't get within 10 feet of this stuff. And then they miss huge areas. And you can work around upper chest, serratus anterior, and all sorts of stuff without violating somebody at all. So it's a great question. Now we're going to talk about pec minor in just a second. Pec minor runs right underneath the breast, right underneath it. Um, and we'll talk about how to get to it though too. So it's a great question. Um, you have the arm raised off the table if you're laying supine and your arm is off the table. Can you... Yep. Get right in there. Yep. Okay. Sure can. And if you really had some problem, just so you guys know, if you really for sure needed to get in the serratus anterior and you had a good relationship with your client, things like that, I would ask them to hold their breasts through the sheet and keep it out of my way. Now, I wouldn't ask that to somebody who was like already seeming shy and stuff, but I would be like, hey, if we really need to work on that and I was worried because of how their breast tissue is falling, I'd be like, through the sheet, will you hold your breast here? And that way they're protecting themselves and I'm working over here. And that's another option. Also, sideline's a great option because on the side, gravity takes the breast away from you. Yeah, these are all options. And good communication works 100% of the time. I've never once, not once had a problem in my life. Just, you know, talk to people. Okay, so serratus anterior hooks to the medial border of the scapula on the anterior side. Essentially, it hooks to the entire medial border. So it's touching the rhomboids major, rhomboids minor, and levator scapula. Yeah, thank you. Um, it attaches into the first eight or nine ribs. And we'd literally number the ribs just like you'd think we would. We have one, rib two, rib three, rib four, or five, or six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. But it goes to the first eight or nine. It says eight or nine because on some of you it goes to eight of your ribs, on some of you it goes to nine. Those of you that are cool like me, it goes to nine. Actually, I have no way of knowing. I've never counted it on anybody. Um, it's just different. People are slightly different. Cool? And it sticks out from underneath the lats and hooks to your hooks to your ribs. And it, and it goes down at an angle. So think about this for a second. The rhomboids run up at an angle. The rhomboids elevate and retract. The serratus anterior uh, depresses and protracts. So the rhomboids run up a little bit and back. The serratus anterior runs down a little bit and back. So the rhomboids elevate, retract, or adduct. The serratus anterior depresses the scapula and protracts, or abducts. They're meant to slide your scapula around your body. This stuff isn't always arguing. It's meant to allow me to do really cool things with my scapula. Like saw wood. By the way, speaking of sawing wood, serratus means teeth-like. Serratus anterior. It's the teeth-like muscle because these look like teeth coming out from underneath your, like saw teeth coming out from underneath your lats. 
serratus anterior, the saw teeth muscle, muscle, saw teeth muscle on the anterior side of your body. Um, Miss Hunter, Miss Hunter, for one million dollars, is there a serratus posterior? Um, <laughs> uh, yes. Yes, you're you're absolutely correct. I owe you one million dollars. Um, how do we know there's a serratus posterior? How do we just know that? I just assume because there's an anterior. Yep, and you you are once again you are once again brilliant. If if I am named Tapscott Junior, then there's definitely a Tapscott Senior. Otherwise, I'd just be tap. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'd just be tap Scott. So, anytime a muscle right. says anterior, you know there's a posterior or inferior. You know there's another one. Just like anytime there's a major, mm -hmm. you know there's a minor. Otherwise, it'd just be Terry's. Cool. That's why I just want to make that point. We're not going to learn about the posterior yet. Don't worry about that. I just want to kind of point that out to you guys. They would have just called it serratus if there was only one, but there's not. There's actually three. Okay. Uh, serratus anterior. Cool. 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 Um, and by the way, serratus anterior can cause a little bit of an uh, upward rotation because of doing the opposite thing of the rhomboids as well. Because the angle, angles, all about angles. Yep. Anyway, I got to show you one more muscle because we're running out of time. Um, but by the way, pay attention to this, this picture on 87 and 88 because it's a great way to palpate for the serratus anterior. If somebody is making a straight arm and they are keeping all this straight and they're just pushing the arm out by, by protracting the scapula, they're going to be doing that with the serratus anterior. And when you feel something flex underneath your hand, that's the serratus anterior. And it's hard to find because it's right on top of the ribs. So when you're touching somebody, you're like, those are your ribs. And they are. But if you feel the ribs get fatter for a second or harder for a second, that's them flexing their serratus anterior. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Last. Uh, most, oh, here. This is kind of for you, Ms. John, as you were talking about with serratus anteriors and breast tissue. But I argue that it's not underneath the breast tissue, and this kind of picture kind of shows that it is. And it's not. Okay, last one. This is the pectoralis minor. Uh, Miss Cooper, if there's a pectoralis minor, is there a pectoralis major? Yeah, oh, there's got to be. There's got to be, thank you. The pectoralis minor runs deep to the pectoralis major. So there's a pectoralis minor here and a pectoralis major on top of it. We're not going to learn about the major today. They actually do very different things. Okay? They're just found in the pectoral region. The pectoralis minor likes to insert, they say, in the medial surface of the coracoid process. This coracoid process, medial surface is just the inside of it. So the lateral surface is the outside of it. Medial surface and it goes into ribs three, four, and five. So take your, your gang sign out again. Do this. Yep. How many fingers are you holding? Three. Yep. What ribs does this insert into? Somebody tell me. Anybody? Which rib numbers, my dear? Not clavicle. Third, fourth, and fifth. Yep. Third. Everybody, third, fourth, and fifth. This three-pronged muscle that almost is exactly the size of this, that almost exactly looks like this, that's almost found exactly in this location of my body, hooks to ribs three, four, and five. Boom. It hooks to my coracoid process of my scapula up here, and hooks down into ribs three, four, and five. It looks almost exactly like this. If it if it pulls, 
it pulls my scapula forward and down. It protracts it and depresses it. Anybody out there like to do dips? This is one of the muscles you use to do dips because it pulls your scapula down and forward. Protracts it or abducts it and depresses it. And, Miss Petrie, you were talking about how we measure rotation from the acromion process and you said coracoid process. And I said, well, you can use that too because they're in the same place. This muscle grabs onto the coracoid process and pulls it down. So it creates a downward rotation. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah? That's the pectoralis minor. And I think I lied to you. I think I actually have one more muscle to show you that I have to show you really quickly. It's a tiny one. Pectoralis minor, by the way, to me is one extremely important muscle, kind of like the levator scapula that could pinch on stuff in your neck. The levator scapula kind of runs across your armpit here. But more importantly, it runs across something we call the brachial plexus, which is the nerves that come out the side of your neck and the artery that comes across here and the veins that come across here that feed your entire arm. If this muscle gets tight, it can cut off blood supply and nerve supply to your arm. When this muscle gets tight, you get tingling in your hands. You feel weakness in your hands. You feel numbness in your hands, aching in your arm. Yeah? Miss Belotic. Miss Belotic, um, this muscle, the pectoralis minor, when it gets tight, it can pinch your brachial plexus, and, which is the nerves that feed your arm, and it can uh, pinch the arteries and, and veins that feed your arm and stuff like that, so your arm can get cold, you can get numbness, tingling, all that kind of stuff in your arm when the pectoralis uh, minor is tight. Does that mean that everybody that comes to me with tingling in their hands, cold hands, weak hands, things like that, has a tight pectoralis minor? Like everyone that comes yeah. in? Yeah. If somebody comes in and says, hey, my hand's kind of tingling and stuff like that, am I like, pectoralis minor? Uh, I, no. Thank you. No. Because One does not make, make the other. other. The, right. right. The pectoralis minor can cause those problems. That doesn't mean everybody with those problems has a tight pectoralis minor. I just want us to be very careful about being starting to diagnose stuff way, way incorrectly. It could mean other tight muscles. It could mean they have a problem down in their wrist. A wrist problem will give you all those symptoms too. An elbow problem will give you all those symptoms too. A heart attack will give you all those, those symptoms too. But it's one of the things I would look at. That's just the point I wanted to make. Yeah? It's one of the areas that I would work. Right? Now, the pectoralis major causes a downward, like a, a, a depression and a protraction or an abduction. So it's the opposite of the rhomboids too. So can the pectoralis minor fight with the rhomboids? Miss Hanson, can the pectoralis minor fight with the rhomboids? Uh, yes. Hell yes. Yes. Yes, it can, all day long. So, the pectoralis minor and the serratus anterior kind of pull stuff forward and down. The rhomboids and levator scapula pull stuff back and up. And this can fight with this. And so, I know that you guys are going to be extra amazing massage therapists, and when somebody comes to you with tight shoulders, you're not just going to rub their traps. You're going to look at their rhomboids, and then you're going to go, ah. Oh. If the rhomboids are tight, it's possible these other muscles in front are fighting them and trying to keep this person in good posture. I'm going to loosen up their pectoralis minor and their serratus anterior. And that's why when they go to you, they're going to get more relief than when they go to somebody else. And that's why you're going to get paid twice as much as somebody else.
because you literally get paid for personality and performance in this field. You literally get paid for personality and performance in this field. You literally get paid for personality and performance in this field. So there are two things that you need. Be kind and learn your anatomy. All right. And you're doing that, by the way. That wasn't a lecture. That was just like, it was a lecture, but it was a lecture like we're in the right direction. Um, and one client can change your life. One client. Subclavius, last little tiny little muscle. Where's your clavicle, everybody? Where's your clavicle? Thank you. Miss Nguyen, yes, touch your clavicle again. Thank you. Your clavicle is your collarbone. Sub means under, so touch right underneath your coll collarbone. Rub right in there, everybody. Ooh, yeah. Rub right in there. You are rubbing, you're rubbing your upper, upper pectoralis major, but you're also rubbing your subclavius. It's a tiny little muscle that can pull down your clavicle or lift up your first rib. By the way, your book says lift up your first rib. I think that's really stretching it. Oh, okay, I'll give it to him. It hooks between your clavicle and your first rib, right? And it kind of runs diagonal like this. So it can pull down my collarbone, help stabilize it, or it can lift up my first rib and help me breathe. Again, I'll take the word for it. But the point is, it's this little muscle underneath here. It feels really good to rub people there. Rub right underneath the clavicle because you're hitting lots of stuff. You're hitting the pectoralis major and you're hitting the subclavius. Just a cute little muscle under there. But do we see how it can, it can pull down the clavicle? That's the really important part. It can depress the clavicle. If we can get into it right under there. That was a lot of muscles. I'm really feeling for you guys. Allison, how are you feeling about this? Have you got all this? Yeah? How's your mom doing? Is she paying attention? Yeah. Okay. You let me know if I have to if we have to talk to her, give her a time out or anything. Okay. All right. Um, okay. That's a lot of stuff. Everybody, I'm gonna go around. And, uh, and laugh a lot. I'm like, who's the class name? It's Allison. I know. I know that's our new classmate, Allison. We're getting rid of Miss Torres and we're going to keep Allison. Yeah. Um, no, we'll keep them both. All right. I'm going to go around and just ask you something you learned today. I know it was a lot. It was a lot, but I, I can't tell you this was one of the most pleasurable lectures I've ever had because you guys asked questions that really made me think. I'm, I'm really excited about the next eight months. I mean, I'm really excited. So I just want to go around, just tell me something you learned today, something that you already knew but don't want to forget, something, anything, just something from today. Yeah? Yeah, please. Miss Nguyen. Miss Nguyen. Yes, we call on you first. Uh, Miss Nguyen, just, by the way, I called on you first because you're the first square on my, my screen. Yeah, Miss Nguyen, okay. tell me something that you learned today. Uh, today I learned in the Labrashikapura. Uh, yeah. In the, uh, in the neighbor. Wait. Neighbor. Uh, oh, the nerve. The, the nerves. Yeah, nerve. can bench on the nerves. Okay. And one other thing. One other thing. With me, can you say trap, easy, us? Trap, easy, us. Trapezius. Easier, easier. Trap, easier. Awesome. It's a great day. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Miss Hansen, one thing you learned today. That the serratus anterior and the, um, oh gosh. We're going to go by the Pectoralis minor work together. Yes, thank you for putting it that way because I didn't even say that. Serratus anterior and pectoralis minor work together. Well said. Yeah, I don't know if that's true 100% of the time, but 99% of the time they work together. Absolutely well said. And yes, perfect. Thank you. Miss Felix Osuna, tell me something you learned today. Um, I didn't know we had a muscle underneath the pedicle. 
Yeah, the subclavius. Muscle underneath the clavicle. Thank you. Mr. Kandaris, yes. tell me something you learned today, sir. I learned that you can access a lot of these uh, muscles through the sideline position, which I think is pretty cool. Because I'm excited to yeah. learn that. That was actually, yeah. th thank you. That's actually a, a very bright insight. Sideline is perfect for the muscles we've been talking about. Almost all the muscles we've been talking about since we started learning about muscles are really easily accessed through, through the sideline. Thank you, sir. Miss Cooper, um, tell me something you learned today. Uh, I learned that um, your personality is really important as a massage therapist. Oh. Thank you, Miss Cooper. Thank you. <laughs> that was actually more important than anything else I taught you today. Thank you. Miss Stanley, something you learned today. Something important today. Something today. I just thought it was interesting that the serratus anterior, like even though in the book it pictures it like it's part of the breast, but it's actually under it. Oh, definitely under it. Um, and not even really under it. It's really on the side. Yeah, it's just the way they're, yeah. they're shooting it from the front, and that's why it looks that way. But thank you. That's super important. Uh, Miss Belotic, something you learned today. Um, I didn't know that there was muscle like in the middle of the ribs, the stenalis, like that thin one. I don't know what muscle you're talking about. In the book. But something we learned today. Oh, something today. <laughs> interesting on the neck how many muscles are there yes like i know the trapezius goes up but i didn't know all the little ones that go. i can't wait till we can like someday i'll come in and we'll do neck work and foot work <laughs> and it's amazing you can spend like two hours on somebody's head and neck it's incredible thank you yes necks are complex they're amazing people love it when you work them miss harper something that you learned today um that there's a lot of muscles like if you remove the major muscles the trapezius there's under there's still like minor yeah. or muscles beneath on it yeah yeah i love what you just said so there are layers of muscles we always just kind of think of one thing but we're not like driving on a road right we're like miners right yeah. so you could be you could be at the right place but not down deep enough in our in our field absolutely yes very cool. Thank you. Miss Hunter, Miss Hunter, something that you learned today besides that the weather affects your Wi-Fi and drives you crazy, probably. <laughs> yeah, it does, but it's all right. <laughs> uh, what did I learn today? Yeah, something. Um, what I learned um, is not to be so afraid of, like, the neck area um, because... Like, I'm still scared about that, like, in, in class. Thank you. Um, and so I'm really, really timid, like, when it comes to the neck. So um, you said it's not as uh, fragile as it seems. <laughs> so helpful. Hey, let me give you guys a piece of advice that I 100% agree with. Essentially, there is nothing that you can do slowly to the body that's dangerous before the client will yell at you. I can even take my finger and slowly poke it in my eye, and eventually I'm like, stop! But I've caused, <laughs> but I've caused no eye damage. The only time you get in trouble in massage is when you do stuff quick. Mm. Right? So, massage done quickly is karate. <laughs> you, you can poke somebody even in the ear slowly, and they're going to be like, okay, that's my ear. Stop. So... You can, I can push the front of somebody's throat slowly and they're going to be like, I don't think that's right. You might want to, and it's all, I'm fine. It's only when you go fast that it's a problem. So you can try anything in massage if you are communicating with your client, anything if you're communicating with your client, if it's done slowly and you will not do damage, period, period. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. And I advise you, like if you got a fun partner that's like, yeah, let's poke on that. Do it. Just do it slow and get feedback from them. Cool. Thank you for saying that. Uh, Miss Petrie, something you learned today. Um, okay. Did you say that 90% of the time the 
Actualis Minor and, and Serratus Anterior essentially work together. Yes. They do very similar things. Okay. Yeah. Well, the only reason I say 90% of the time is I don't know how your brain works. It might be like we don't need one of them for this movement, but basically they work together. Okay. Cool. I just want to... Good. I love it. That's, I want you to pair muscles together that way in your head, so that's fantastic. Serratus Anterior and Pectoralis Minor. Ms. Torres, something you learned today. Um, that sometimes that sometimes you think that your client has a knot, but it's not. It's, it's you running into the other layer of the muscle. You're going across a different direction of fiber. Thank you very much. Ms. Jana, something you learned today. Um, that the way you speak about muscles changes with your client's knowledge of muscles. Thank you. Yep. Meet somebody where they're at. I love it. Ms. Hanson, something you learned today? Did I already call on you? I got lost, so. You already called on me, but Thank I can answer again if you want. No, because I got to call on two other people I'm pretty sure I missed. Okay. Miss Monreal, something you learned today? Um, Just about the levator scapula and the trapezius working together. Upper fibers, trapezius, and levator scapula kind of work together. Middle fibers, the trapezius, and rhomboids working together. Miss Cooper, something you learned today, Miss Cooper? I already told you something, but I can tell oh, you something else. Then I got everybody. Tell me something else. Yeah. Um, I learned Quickly. that the rhomboids, like, they pull back. Yes. Thank you. They're I actually like putting it in layman's terms. They pull back. Yeah. Which is a retraction or an adduction, but they pull back. Thank you. All right, everybody. Fantastic day. I'm sorry about just cramming information down your throats. But it's fantastic that you were, uh, the questions and the engagement, and I really appreciate you all being involved and thinking, um, and I'm very excited about your futures as a massage therapist. I look forward to seeing you guys walk in here at lab. I'm sure that you will dig around and try to find this stuff on people. Yeah? Um, remember, by the way, it's your lab. If Mr. Ibarra doesn't bring this stuff up, you go find it. Go digging for it. Poke around. Try to figure it out. It's a guessing game, so, so go for it. Cool? Yeah. All right. Good game. Bye, everybody. We have a test, right? Oh, you do. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You have a test, everybody. I'm going to release it right now. Thank you. I'll put out an announcement about it, but yes, you do. I've got to release it right now. I what wonder... about homework? Do we have homework tonight? Not anymore, you don't, because we didn't get to the test. I'm not going to give you double. I was going to, but we're not going to. I'm just going to release just the test. It's coming in just a second. Hold on. Ooh, well, I think it's coming in just a second. Sorry, my computer's refreshing because it sat still for so long, my canvas. Um, anyway, I was going to give homework tonight besides the test, but it's just too much. All right, so it's just, uh, not that, it's just number 17 test. Shoulders, arms, rhomboids, levator scapula, pec minor, serratus anterior, subclavius. Number 17 test. And I just released it. And I, by the way, all of you on this call, I will probably put out an announcement about this test for anybody that dropped off the call. You can ignore that. You know that there is a test. You should be able to see it right now. Yep. Can we stay on while we do it just in case we need help? Sure. I got to check my calendar, but I think, I think I'm fine. Let me see. Oh, well, I can stay on for a little bit. All right. Yeah. Yeah, start it. See what happens. I'm here.